meeting of the Board of Education Community High School one, District 128 for Tuesday, January 28th. If I could ask everybody to please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, roll we'll call, please. Jim Batson. Here. John Carmichael. Here. Pat Rudy. Here. Lisa Essel. Here. Kevin Huber, Karen Lundstedt, Casey Rooney. Here. All right, so we note um, Karen Lundstedt and Kevin Huber are out this evening, uh, but we still have our quorum. All right. Um, first of all, let me just welcome everybody. This is actually a little overwhelming. <laughs> so, a good way. It is a good way. Um, one second. <laughs> Please silence your phones. Um, okay, so now we can go. All right, our agenda today, um, we will uh, open it up to public comment. Anybody would like to speak? The one thing I would ask is that you try to limit yourselves to three minutes or less. Um, yeah, and, and try not to be repetitive. If somebody's already brought up whatever issue it is you want to bring to our attention. Um, we will have uh, some student recognition and a presentation from the Vernon Hills High School Student Diversity Council. Uh, we'll get updates from our student school board reps. Uh, and then each of us is gonna update some items on um, a conference we went to in late November. We will have the superintendent's report. We'll approve the consent vote agenda, which we reviewed earlier this month. Uh, we'll have brief updates from program and personnel. We're gonna read everyone in um, no. Uh, and facilities and finance. I uh, just have a couple comments on CEDAW. Anything from ISBJ? Uh, uh, no. no. Okay. And uh, then we will convene an executive session tonight, uh, which should be relatively brief, and we will not be taking any action after the executive session tonight. And that's it. Okay. Brian has one update. Okay. On the, on the student recognition, um, unfortunately, they're sick today, so we okay. will uh, recognize them in February. Okay. All right. No problems. So we will eliminate. Item 2BI, correct? And then we'll only have the diversity council. Okay. All right, anybody from the public who would like to speak? Um, just state your name and address. Amal Hassan. As a district, the Dairy Mission is connected to every aspect of our schools and it connects us to the fundamentals of being a wildcat or a cougar. We value diversity and we participate in change for the greater good, it says. Yet the system that says to be so inclusive is putting us down. But it is teaching me that I need to do things instead of waiting for them to be done for me, and to raise awareness on issues of discrimination, and to promote a more global view on the world to allow our daring mission to, to be fulfilled to its fullest potential. We are a district that is built to be multi-faith and multicultural. My name is Amal Hassan, a Libertyville High School junior, student council board member, and a proud Muslim. And I am here on behalf of the over 1,000 people, students, and community members who signed my petition to promote Eid as a deserving day off of school and observance, and to promote equality and fairness among the whole district. I want you to imagine not having Christmas off, or if you're Jewish, not having Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur off. Eid is my only hol holiday that I only get to celebrate twice a year. It's our only holiday. It's, a ho it's the holiday where our whole community meets at the Libertyville Sports Complex, pray as, pray as a united group, and see our loved ones and celebrate under the same roof. For every Muslim, Eid is, a time of, Eid is a time of sharing and expressing love, peace, and friendship. Muslims worldwide extend hands to our non-Muslim neighbors and friends. As we extend our arm of inclusivity to the non-Muslim community, please consider us and extend your arm of welcoming. As I looked at the data from the 2000 to 2010 Lake County Census, I found that there was a huge increase in Muslim families living in Lake County. And being in a new decade, I can only confirm this number will increase even more because I walk into the mosque daily and see the welcoming of a new family to our community. As time goes on, school being on aid will only affect more students and their families. For example, in 2023, there will be an increase of 49 Muslims from just Oak Grove alone, and it will affect all of them and their families. I talked to principals of both schools and other faculty and staff, and some common questions, some common questions and concerns were raised. 
like that it being that it shifts every year, no other schools around have it off, or more days being added in summer. Well, let's begin with it shifting every year. If we're arguing that this holiday shifts every year, let's look at Good Friday, Easter, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur. And we've been adaptable in the past to these holidays. But, as you can see in front of you, I have, um, Islamic Society of North America predicts the date of the holiday well in advance, and the majority of Muslims in Lake County do abide by this date. As you can also see, there are only four A's until 2025 that lie during the school year. So asking for four days off in the next five years isn't too much of a request. To the second point of no other schools around having it off. Let me ask you this. Why does it matter? Why can't, we be, why can't we be the trailblazers in Lake County and be the leading school that initiates this? But let's look at schools that do have it off. For example, Detroit School G District, Dearborn Public Schools, Crestwood School District, Hampshire Public Schools, Skokie High Schools, New York City Public Schools, and Montgomery County, Maryland, and way more are in progress currently. The last thing of more days being added in summer. Well first, what if we implement a Teachers Institute Day on Aid, where students have the day off, teachers don't, but on the, ca on the District 128 calendar, it says Teachers Institute Day slash Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha for Muslims. Another thing, at a recent board meeting, you have recently approved of e-learning days, making a couple of snow days unnecessary. So what is the possibility of, of having those, snow those two snow days being moved and those two days dedicated to having read off instead? The conversation about Eid becoming recognized as a holiday will have to start. So why not start now to promote religious toleration, inclusivity, and respect? With aid off, on top of our school's already amazing achievements, we could be a leading educational institution that promotes equality and diversity among its students. I urge you, as a D128 school board, to serve all students, including us Muslims, and hear us plea for equity. I now would like you to listen to three of my closest friends to speak on the harsh reality of choosing, of choosing faith versus education. Thank you. My name is Emma Black. And I'm a student at Libertyville High School. At LHS, I'm a member of the Model United Nations Executive Board, as well as Link Crew Leader and a participant in art and theater. As a Christian student at Libertyville High School, I recognize my privilege. I recognize the privilege I have to spend my holidays surrounded by family, unconcerned by homework or studying. I recognize my privilege as I have never found myself struggling to choose whether to stay in school or uh, to be surrounded by family celebrating. I have never uh, chosen to subsequently overexert myself for the next week just trying to catch up as a result of missing school. It always seemed to be a given, but it's not. It's a privilege. I recognize my privilege. I do not accept it. Tonight, on behalf of the student body, many of whom are joined with us today, I would like to show my complete support for religious tolerance in District 128. As one of over a thousand signatures, we advocate for the acknowledgement of Eid as a religious holiday and one that should be a non-attendance day. The privilege I speak of should not be a privilege, but a right for all. I'm sure a lot of you have similar memories, happy, carefree holidays spent with family and friends. This is unfortunately not the case for all students in District 128. As individuals, a district, a community, and a, as a country, we support the right to express religion and the right to education. We always have. It is important that we act upon our values, and in that we must be tolerant, respectful, inclusive. Therefore, it is simply unfair to ask of students to choose between two rights, religion and education. I, along with many of you, enjoy the right to spend holidays with family, and I wish the same for all of my peers, regardless of religion. As a district, we stand for recognition and representation of all students. We stand for all faiths. We stand for respect of our peers. We stand to be daring, doing individuals. We stand to make positive change for future students. Now it's our duty to prove it. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Sarah Balabas. 
and I'm a junior at Libertyville High School. I'm involved in activities such as track, student council, coding cats, being a wish leader, and MSA. As you can see, I'm part of the student body. I am the student body, and I'm no different than my peers. I go to school valuing my education more than anyone. I go to see my friends, and I go to be active in my community. But the only difference is that I have to fight to feel valued, to feel like I am heard at school. The only difference is that I am the student who has to choose between the value of my education and the value of my religion, which I believe in so deeply. I'm speaking tonight, highlighting my experiences through a predominantly white school to urge you to welcome diversity and accommodation by recognizing Eid as a holiday to allow me and my other Muslim peers to feel welcome and represented. I understand that Muslims are a minority, but we have to be recognized alongside every other student in District 128. I think I can speak on behalf of every student here on how taxing it really is to miss one day, especially for me my freshman year. Coming from a small and sheltered Oak Grove, I had no clue what to expect for the years to come or what my future would hold at LHS. Going from a class of 100 to five times that was a huge adjustment for me, and I was still trying to find my niche in the school. Still adjusting to high school, Eid fell on my first biology exam on Thursday, August 31st. A class that had already proven very challenging for me. It didn't help that my, my schedule was already filled with such rigorous classes. In first period, I would have to make up the test I missed in biology and grab a take-home quiz a day later than my classmates. In second period of geometry honors, I would have to go in during the time crunch of before school and ask for a whole day's worth of math notes and learn it in 20 minutes. In Spanish, I would have to make up the packets of grammar and speaking exercises alone at home. In geography, I would have to copy down the notes and understand each single bullet point taught to us in class. In English, I would have to read two nights worth of readings and understand the previous nights with no additional class discussion. And in gym, I would have to make up 20 minutes in my heart rate zone during my lunch periods. And that was already tough to manage on top of the mandatory link crew attendance that was mandatory twice a week. All of that just because I had to celebrate my holiday with, I wanted to celebrate my holiday with my family. As you can see, I very much do prioritize my education and always put that before anything else. However, as much as I value my education, when it begins to interfere with my religion, I shouldn't have to compromise two important aspects of my life, especially when my su su surrounding peers don't have to do the same. Each student here fills their own unique role within these schools, including us. We're a part of the student body. We are the student body, and we deserve to have our holiday be recognized. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm a junior at Libertyville High School. I first would like to thank you, the board, for letting me speak today. To not only let me represent my own values and the Muslim students who are part of D128, but also the, for the millions of Muslim students who are part of the public school system, who struggle with their Muslim identity and have to choose whether their faith or their educa education matters more. I, a student, who identifies as a Muslim, as an American Pakistani, and as a Libertyville Wildcat, know what it is like to struggle with my identity of being Muslim. Starting from elementary school, I came face to face with the reality of being a minority. It especially hit me hard during the holiday season and during spring break. Other kids used to be excited during those joyous, joyous occasions, but for me, I used to dread it. Why? Because of all the questions, the pity, and the ignorance. Knowing that I won't have the opportunity to experience the same enthusiasm as any of my classmates. Coming to Libertyville, I knew it was going to be different. High school is a place to open up your mind to challenging ideas and to face your identity head on. But after recent events and feeling specifically targeted by a group who are so openly Islamophobic, I realized that no one is going to stand up against discrimination unless those who are being discriminated do. This is my opportunity to do so. Following my sister's footsteps, I've taken the position of being president of Muslim Student Association and hopes to make District 128 a more inclusive space. But as a student, that should not be my obligation. My job should be the same as every other student, to come to school, to work hard, to be involved, and to feel respected, and to have a voice. Having to choose between my faith and my future not only threatens this voice, but suppresses my right to feel welcome at Libertyville and Vernon Hills. I assure you that if D128 makes E the holiday on the school calendar, 
It will not only give representation to the countless Muslims in our community, spreading awareness of acceptance and tolerance of faith, but it will also set an example for many other public school systems around the United States. I urge you all, please, to remember us, Amal Hassan, Sara Balabis, Zaina Kogzi, and the other tens of wildcats and cougars for standing here, unapologetically Muslim, asking you to no longer make us choose between faith and future. Thank you. Kirsten Michelotti. Um, I just, I, I didn't know that, that this group would be here, and I noticed there are some small children. And my subject matter is not, there's nothing graphic, but it is mature, so I just wanted to kind of tell the parents. My daughter is a District 128 student who was enrolled in the special education program and continued on to the transition program of the Special Education District of Lake County, also referred to as CEDAW. Her years at Libertyville High School were a great success, and she continues to be involved in after-school programs at LHS, including Best Buddies and Special Olympics. Since December of last year, however, there have been a series of events that have greatly impacted her continuing education through District 128. It was reported that a fellow classmate of hers had been sexually assaulted by a teacher at the Seattle location on Atkinson Road in Grace Lake, where they both attended class. The perpetrator has been charged with four counts of felony aggravated criminal sexual assault, four counts of felony criminal sexual assault, and felony aggravated criminal sexual abuse. The abuse occurred over a two-year period at the Cedal Atkinson location where a small number of students, less than about 20, attended class and where approximately eight teachers and paraprofessionals were employed. <laughs> Our family learned of the perpetrator's crimes through the local news, and we were not alerted by CEDAW until the story had become public, public knowledge. The space in which these crimes took place, which I have been to on several occasions, is approximately 1,000 square feet. It's very small. It has been reported that the abuse of the student took place in locations including the conference room adjacent to the classroom space. It is beyond disturbing that the student was being assaulted in a small room while class was taking place just outside. Why did the other CEDAW teachers neglect to locate the whereabouts of a student who should be in class with the others? Why were the teachers and aides so negligent in ensuring the safety of a student in their care? Why aren't two teachers or aides present at times when the student is outside of the classroom? This isn't the first of recently reported abuses occurring in the CEDAW program. Investigations into 21 reports of physical abuse were opened last year at another nearby CEDAW location. While our daughter was not directly victimized in these crimes, upon learning of the assault in her classroom, we immediately removed her from the CEDAW transition program because we feared for her safety. Has District 128 considered bringing the special education transition program in-house as opposed to utilizing an outside program that is clearly not serving its students in the best way possible. Several surrounding high schools, including Stevenson, Barrington, Lake Zurich, and recently Mondelein, provide in-house transition programs. The in-house program in District 128 would not be large, as it would only accommodate students from our own district. As a parent concerned for the safety of our daughter, her fellow classmates, and future transition students, I urge you to strongly consider an alternative to the CEDAW program that has been putting District 128 students directly in harm's way. Every District 128 student deserves the best possible education, and its most vulnerable students deserve a safe and successful transition program. Thank you. comment on uh, what was presented. I was going to wait until after the presentation. We'll do that. Um, 
first of all, to the students who did speak, I don't know if someone left, I think, um, you guys did a wonderful job. Um, I kept looking over at Dr. Lee and said, what year are these guys? Um, because your presentations were extremely passionate, um, extremely powerful, and extremely well thought out. So I really want to applaud um, your courage, frankly, for standing up in front of this group that even I'm intimidated by. Um, so congratulations on that, all right? So here is the one, the commitment that I can make. Obviously this is an issue that we would want to further study. Um, and so we are gonna defer this to, I hate to say it this way, the calendar committee. Um, as you might imagine, and maybe you, you don't or can't, um, putting the annual calendar together is an extremely challenging task which has to take into account the needs and wishes and dreams of a lot of different stakeholders, is the best word, okay? Um, and uh, I know even last year after we thought we had it, we had to redo the whole thing for a lot of reasons. Um, but I promise you this, okay? Uh, we will take the feedback very seriously. Um, I believe we now have students on the calendar committee, okay? So at a minimum, all right, they will be part of the process um, and the recommendations and decision making on where that calendar um, takes place. That's something new that I think we talked about uh, last time we had lunch at uh, Baker Square. Which I think closed. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole, whole other thing. Okay. So I, I promise you we will take the input very seriously. All right. Um, we will consider that among other things. Uh, and. Uh, I'd ask you to just be patient and stay tuned if, until we can really thoroughly vet all the various um, aspects of, of your issue as well as those of the other stakeholders. So, uh, okay. Can I ask a really quick question? Sure. Are the calendar committee meetings open to the public or not? There are members of the public, I believe, on the committee. Is there are. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not. Yeah. Uh, but when the calendar committee makes a recommendation to the board, it will be done at, uh, those discussions are shared with the board at our uh, early month committee meetings public and also the board meeting. So ultimately, the board's legal responsibility is to vote on the calendar for the school district. So any work that the calendar does always comes back to the board and before the board approves anything, as you are all well, well aware, uh, we discuss it at committee meeting or committee meetings mm -hmm. uh, and then we bring it to the board for uh, final adoption or a final vote. So, Pat, I was just going to add to that uh, for our community members that may be your first time with us. Uh, the board uses a committee structure here to do all of the detail work on all of the issues that we deal with. So uh, that's where the board does the yeoman's share of its work. The calendar committee is no different than that. If you stay for the remainder of the meeting tonight, and I'm not suggesting that you have to do that, of course, if you want to stay, we're glad to have you. But you are going to hear the cumulative work that the board has done in both our program and personnel committee, where this issue would come through uh, the pipeline and facilities and finance committee. And then the board will be making final decisions on those issues. So it's important that you understand when we say committee, because sometimes people think of a legislative structure, and if you want to kill a bill, you throw it to committee, okay? Committees are active working parts of how we do our work. The board meetings are the culmination of that work. So Dr. Fisher, Rita, if you want to raise your hand, Dr. Fisher here chairs or facilitates uh, our calendar committee, and we are aware that the students have more detailed information to share in some back work that they've done, and Dr. Fisher will ensure that the students will have an opportunity to present that at the calendar committee, and the calendar committee will do its job <laughs> vetting all of the information and all of the various um, um, items that uh, they have to consider uh, prior to making a recommendation. And be aware we're always working forward on the calendar. You know, we try and work two years in advance uh, on the calendar as we move forward. So, so that uh, means we, we have actually already approved next year's calendar. Yes, so any changes that the calendar committee were to make to our existing structure would be for the filing year, be the, the year yeah. after. And um, yeah. Right, and the dates of the holidays, as, as students have mentioned, like some of the other holidays, uh, change. And so that would just be part of the conversation. You know, that would not be, you know, a reason not to uh, look seriously after that. So uh, you have the board's commitment, my commitment as a superintendent, district administrative team, 
uh, again, you know, Dr. Fisher and the calendar committee, of which the students and some community members and staff members here uh, are involved in, and uh, they do very um, detailed and complex work over a period of time. So uh, the students will have an opportunity to present the additional information that they've prepared uh, for uh, the committee as it goes through its process. And again, it will culminate in some discussions uh, at uh, a board meeting or a committee meeting or meetings uh, prior to making a final decision uh, at a regular board meeting like this. Okay. So, and can I actually just make a few comments? So one, because there is so there are so many people here, can you just give us an idea of who is on that committee? Not necessarily names, but stakeholders. Yeah. And then also just a rough idea of the calendar for the calendar committee. Just so, you know, there is roughly an annual event. So the rough timing, you work on it between now and whenever, and you know, whenever is when you're going to present it back. And then of course, just to clarify what was said earlier, so no, that committee's not going to have broad representation from the community because if we had 100 people from the community we'd probably never have a calendar but there will be time during the year when both at the committee meetings that we have the first Monday second Monday of every month okay um, as well as at the board meeting which is the fourth Monday of every month where that calendar recommendation will be presented to the board that is certainly an appropriate time for anyone from the public who wants to come and comment on it to come and do so okay our calendar committee includes about 25 people that represent uh, both of our communities, uh, Libertyville and Vernon Hills uh, High School. Uh, we have a parent representative from each of the high schools. Um, and our parent representatives have always done a really good job of holding their constituencies, working with our, uh, their neighbors and friends and contacts to uh, bring that feedback to the calendar committee meeting. Uh, we have a school board representative on the calendar committee, and we have educators and administrators from the two high schools uh, on the calendar committee. Um, we have a um, representative of the union that has also done polling of all of our teaching staff uh, regarding calendar formation. And we have principals that we've operated under in the design of the calendar uh, based on the Regional Office of Education recommended school calendar, Illinois School Code, the dates of our graduation and final exam. So that's always our starting point, but we're happy and very excited to include student voice in our upcoming meeting. Um, that is the piece that we have been missing. And so um, we've had that through parents before, but having direct representation from students, we're, we're excited about that change. Um, we do plan, try to plan a couple of years in, adva in advance, but we don't always have all the information necessary to make a decision two years in advance. So we begin to look at drafts um, two years out, and then we review those drafts over time. So in February, we'll be taking a second look at the 21-22 um, calendar um, that we've already started to review when we adopted the 2021 calendar. There is an opportunity through school code to offer calendar amendments to already adopted calendars as well. So um, that February meeting will be a starting point for discussing uh, this issue. And um, we certainly will plan at that February meeting whether we would talk about the issue and in invite additional um, students to present. Right. What we I heard know, tonight. Um, the representative of the girls and I, we all talked about how excited we are to be at the February meeting because I know students were not like invited before yeah. and we talked about it. Um, I think this is a really good opportunity because, I mean, in my journalism tab class, we always look at Illinois like report cards for our schools and stuff. And I know for Vernon Hills, our student body is 60% white while our teaching staff is 98% white. So having just educators and parents or a parent is not very reflective of the student body, so I think it's a really good opportunity to have students. Thank you. We're excited about that too. Well, and I, and I will say when uh, we met with the students last month, and at our, at our um, again for the public, we meet once a month. Dr. Grudy, myself, uh, Dr. Gilliam, and Dr. Colentis, two principals, with our six student board representatives over lunch once a month. And um, so we have an opportunity to talk about things that are going on in the district or things we should be thinking about. And so when we talked about the opportunity of the students joining 
uh, that uh, calendar committee. I think some of you almost jumped out of your chairs with joy. So uh, that may be a little bit of an overstatement, but you were very excited uh, about the possibility, and we're very excited to, you know, have that voice as, you know, part of uh, the important committee. So. And I, I agree with you, you're correct. In the years that I've been serving as the um, facilitator of the calendar committee, there have really been no changes to the, um, the kinds of representation that we have at the committee meetings. So this is um, an exciting change and an important one. Yeah, and then I'll make one last comment, and I'm pretty sure I speak on behalf of this whole board, but I want everybody to understand it. Um, there are a number of things that I think we as a board, as an administration, take very seriously in this district, okay? Um, foremost on my mind is student safety and security, okay? Um, but I would say the other that I can assure you is extremely important to every single one of us. And, and I, you know, I know for me personally, because I've spent some time outside of this country, um, and that is for each and every student in this district, I'm gonna say to feel equally welcome, okay? I acknowledge that we, as is true in I think the broader context of the community and society in general, fall short of where we probably wanna be someday, um, but I don't think I'm overstating how much it means to us to continue to pursue that goal, okay? Um, I just can think of no other option, okay? So that's not a promise that we're gonna do everything that everybody wants, because that's just not practical. Um, but I think it's important to realize that at the core, um, that is a real core value, I believe, of this place, this board, this administration, and I hope of this community, okay? So again, I applaud your courage in coming forward. Um, that was among the more passionate um, presentations we've had in a while, uh, and that is not done easily. So thank you very much for, for what you guys did tonight. We okay. heard you. Yeah, we heard you. So for the audience, we're gonna move on with the rest of the board agenda. We'd love to have you stay, but at this point, if you want to leave, you certainly have the option to do that.
Thank you. Next up, uh, Vernon Hills High School Student Diversity Council, Dr. Gilliam. Thanks, I'm uh, John Gilliam, principal of Vernon Hills High School. And I think on, on the heels of that uh, really well done dynamic presentation, tonight's board presentation fits right in. I actually wish, uh, I wish they all would have stayed. I think they would have really enjoyed it. Um, as tonight, I think we just take that that uh, issue of equity and inclusion uh, to the next step with another example. Uh, the board knows that as a district, each school, Libertyville and Vernon Hills, has um, continued uh, its its commitment to issues of equity uh, and inclusion. Uh, and the board presentations that we've had this year already, including uh, our English learners group, we had a group from Best Buddies talking about another issue of inclusion have, have highlighted some of those and tonight is no different. Uh, tonight it's my pleasure as Principal of Vernon Hills to welcome a group of students who will speak to that issue and some of the work being done at Vernon Hills and of course it makes me proud. Uh, I do think it's important to note that, that Dr. Clentes and the students and faculty and staff at Libertyville are doing some of the same things through their equity leadership team uh, and while we get to hear from our group tonight uh, there's similar great stuff going on at uh, Libertyville. Uh, to introduce them, though, is our two equity coordinators. And just as a side note, I have been uh, pleased and proud to see them lead in a uh, passionate and selfless way over this year. Uh, so it's my privilege to introduce Amy Christian and Terry Young. Good evening. Um, so my name is Tara Young. I'm an English teacher here at Vernon Hills and also one of the equity coordinators. And we are so thrilled and grateful that you have uh, invited us here tonight to hear about what we're doing through our Student Diversity Council. Uh, our message, I think, is really in line with the amazing message that you just heard from our friends over at LHS that our district values equity and we care about the inclusion and representation of all of our students. And Amy and I are so um, honored and grateful to work with an incredibly dynamic group of students who are passionately committed to this equity work that we're doing at Vernon Hills. Um, and I think this clicker, oh, I don't know what happened. There we go. Um, so I'm going to show you something that you all know that you've already been hearing tonight, but you know that our district is committed to equity. So much so that it's actually built into the mission, um, our, into our daring district mission. And so we know that we value diversity. We know that we seek to understand the varied experiences and realities of others. We know that we delve into complexity and ambiguity. We also know that we ponder problems, question convention, and propose solutions. And this work is exactly the type of work that our Student Diversity Council has been embarking on this year. So it's been really exciting in our position to get to work with staff, but also a really important part of our job is working with students. And so one such way that we are collectively working together to empower students to be a part of these conversations about equity is through our Student Diversity Council, many of whom you see right here behind us who are gonna spend way more time talking than we are because you wanna hear from them anyway. So this is a group that's committed to equity and inclusion in several different ways. Over the course of first semester in this past month, some of the ways we've been doing this work is including students alongside staff in their own professional learning, as well as, thank you, um, exploring our own identities, um, learning about our, ourselves, and then um, teaching each other's. And then finally, through, um, sometimes it doesn't want to click with us, um, through reading and discussing a book called Waking Up White and, and Finding Myself in the Story of Race by Debbie Irving alongside staff. So they're going to highlight those three different episodes for you just a little bit. We're going to start off with the Lunch and Learns. Typically, as you know, um, Lunch and Learns are provided for staff to take part in professional learning. And this has been an exciting thing for us to ask for students to come alongside our staff members in that learning. And um, Abby and Vander are going to tell us all about that. Thank you, Avi and Vander. All right, so I'm Avi Hassel. Um, I've attended a bunch of these um, staff lunch and learns, and the two that I've been to have both been about race and racism and our awareness of both. So the first one was um, we watched Melody Hobson's TED Talk um, about colorblind or color brave, and it talked about the importance of discussions about race and racism, and we discussed how that applies to our, our own school and our environment. Um, and then the next one we read and discussed um, the introduction of Waking Up White 
and we discuss the realizations and lack thereof of privilege and the understanding that we have of our own racial identities. Um, I found it to be very beneficial to be at these staff learning sessions because I think a lot of these discussions end up circling back to the students. And a lot of these discussions revolve around what we're learning in school and what we're discussing as um, staff and as students. So I think it's been very fascinating and been very be beneficial for us to be there to learn along with the teachers and see the work that they're doing that ends up impacting us. Okay, and I'm Xander Cube. Um, one of the most like impactful parts of these Lunch and Learns is the discussions that we have afterwards, um, where both staff and students together can um, share their own experiences when it comes to these topics, as well as what they've learned and kind of unpacking um, what the videos were about and the media was about. Um, which is very important because it fulfills our overall goal, which is to talk about race, to talk about issues that are uncomfortable for a lot of people, um, which can open a lot of people's minds, and I feel like it really has been just through these discussions that we've been having. Um, it's very important that we have these conversations to normalize talking about race, especially in our schools that are predominantly white, both with staff and student body. It's important to understand the role that privilege has when it comes to our schools and um, our curriculum and through these conversations I definitely feel like there has been um, a lot of learning being done in these lunch and learns um, so I think that it's very important what we're doing. So in addition to um, the lunch and learns we also meet every other Friday morning um, and again we've been focusing a lot on student learning and exploring our own identities in those morning meetings and so now I'm going to invite uh, um, Amelia and Hannah to talk about that. Hello, hello. my name is Amelia Tarani and I'm currently a junior and so um, I started in Student Diversity Council this, this past year and one reason I continue to keep coming back each and every week is all the talks about religion and like culture because everyone is different and we all have to accept and learn about those differences so I think it's really cool how each and every time we get to talk about our own religions or other people's religions and to get more knowledge and background and that's one of the reasons I love Student Diversity Council here at Vernon Hills High School. I'm Hannah Kapoor and I'm a sophomore this year and I started coming to Student Diversity Council this year and I started coming because um, I found it very easy to just be in your own bubble when you come to high school and only surround yourself with people you can relate to or people you understand. And it's very common even in, like, in the real world to do that as well. But coming here, I've been able to learn so much more about different identities that people have here. And one way that that was done is by the social identity wheel. And everyone would pick out the gold piece for each of the categories. And um, you could see like where people what people value more in their lives. Like some people had a bigger slice for like language because that was a really important part of their life or some people had more for um, like race because they really identified with where they're from. So it was interesting to see like compared to what preconceived notions you had of other people versus what they're actually like because it's very different. It's very important to understand those differences and understand why you think those are different. And also just to um, be able to um, like respect people's differences and admire them as well. Um, so one of the other things that we did in our Friday morning meetings is uh, craft a lesson. So we're also trying to empower our students to, to lead learning. And so they crafted a lesson for our freshman transition program um, that was about finding your home at Vernon Hills. And Nicole Herrera is going to talk a little bit about that and her experience in Student Diversity Council. She also hates that her face is <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the video. <laughs> we love her. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nicole Herrera. I'm a senior. I'm from the video. <laughs> <laughs> this is my first year in Student Diversity Council, and I, like going off of what my peers said, I think it's very important to value diversity and inclusion because we can all learn from everyone's culture, and it's a good thing to be culturally aware and understanding of our peers. And so I found my home in Student Diversity Council because I've gotten to learn so much about other people's identities and their cultures and everything. And I remember my freshman year, and especially the first day of school, and I was walking up the stairs, and I lost my flip-flop. So I had to run back down the stairs and get my flip-flop. So that was pretty eventful. 
but what I remembered the most from my freshman year was walking into my freshman lit honors class and looking around and seeing that there wasn't anyone else with like a Latinx background as I was. And at first I felt like a little bit taken aback and like a fish out of water. But then I made a bunch of new friends and everything. Everyone made me feel super included. And I found a club named Latino Alliance and I'm currently the president. And there's other people in the club who share the same identity as me, same traditions, food, culture and everything. And I really love being Latina. It makes a big part of my identity. And Student Diversity Council allows me to contribute my personal viewpoint and also understand everyone else's viewpoint. Thank you. So as you heard, our second Lunch and Learn was about the opening of Debbie Irving's Waking Up White. And um, sparked by that Lunch and Learn, we've kicked off a book study with the Vernon Hills staff as well as some folks who are sitting here right here in front of you who will um, make the trek over to our building. Um, it's an invitation to study the entire book together. And we thought it might be interesting to ask if any of our SDC students wanted to also study that book. And we had two students say yes, on top of their course load, on top of everything else they are involved in, they too are are reading this entire memoir alongside us and alongside our staff. Um, and so Gabby and Shay are going to talk to you about what that experience is like. Hi, my name is Gabriella Arribas. And I think we wanted to read the book because something that's really, really important to me is that all of the students feel well, all students feel welcome in school. And learning about how the staff was going to be reading this book, I felt comforted because I know that I walk into school and Hala pointed out earlier that 98% of the teachers are um, white. And I know that as a Latinx student, I don't often see myself represented um, in our teaching staff. And I think one of the things that, that can really change um, is that staff have more, um, that the staff are more sensitive to racial issues. And I think um, by no means is this a bad school at all, um, but every school should be heightening their racial awareness and having these conversations. And so when the opportunity came to read the book, um, I felt like it was important to go along, especially after um, being in the Lunch and Learns and on all that. I felt like it was something that I should continue, uh, especially since um, I've been learning a lot this year that it's not enough to just be not racist. You have to actively participate in anti-racist work. And I think um, one of the ways that I'm going to learn and continue to learn is through the book. So that's why I wanted to read it. Uh, my name is Shay Neary. And so far in the book, um, I can only speak for myself here, not so much Gabby, but I know that um, as the author's white, I've kind of seen myself in her and the ways that she's realizing her own ignorance about certain issues, um, relating especially to um, her growing up and versus like how um, like a black family would grow up. And this has just been really eye-opening for me because obviously I knew that there were differences before, but just seeing this kind of um, through her eyes as well has just really shown me that I'm not alone in my thinking, but by opening myself up, um, I can clearly learn a lot. And um, also just, reading this book in like uh, such a safe space with um, Miss Young and Miss Christian and Gabby, um, it's just really rewarding and I'm very thankful for it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we are so very thankful for all of these amazing kiddos behind us. Can you give them a round of applause? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your interest in, in hearing the work we've been up to. So um, come on forward if you've got any questions. Um, we'd love to, you know, hear your thoughts too. Can we maybe take a picture with the group, Harry? Absolutely. Okay, maybe John and Pat. Uh, <laughs> 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 Your lead, it's going to be a much better place than it is today. Thank you. Thank you. I can't promise I will be. Or maybe we'll just shift.
<laughs> yeah, you guys will all just like go right a little bit. Just like, yeah, yeah, you. Of course you. Of course you. just start with that so as we said before you know once a month we meet with the student board reps for probably 20 years in this district way before I even came 15 years ago to the district uh, that meeting has been taking place at Baker's Square in Libertyville and much to my chagrin Mr. Kelly broke the news to me today that like literally overnight Baker Square closed so uh, we are going to have to find another uh, place to meet. Dr. Gilliam suggested maybe trying Lazy Dog, you know, the new restaurant uh, between Vernon Hills, or right over here. Uh, but we would certainly be open to suggestions, but wow, we're going to miss that pie, right? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so that's the bad news. Now you can pick us up with the good news. All right, in more positive aspects, um, this month Vernon Hills hosted an academic fair during all lunch periods. So it's kind of similar to the eighth grade orientation, but this one is more specifically targeted towards students that already attend the high school. And they just had a um, opportunity to explore courses for next year and ask teachers questions about recommendations on what courses are like. Um, this was just really useful because it came right before class registration. Our Turnabout Spirit Week is coming up with different theme days. Vernon Hills Student Council is ready for Turnabout and the dance is gonna be themed A Blast from the Past. Um, the dance is being hosted on February 15th, and students are excited for Spirit Week, which will include Denim Day, High Dye Tuesday, Rock and Roll Wednesday, Throwback Thursday, my personal favorite, and um, a white out for Friday's pep rally. We want to say congratulations to the Varsity Boys Bowling Team for wearing the IHSA Sectional Championship this past week in the Sycamore. Senior Jacob Gates led the way as the Individual Sectional Championship Champion. Andrew Cougars are also competing for state hardware this coming weekend in O'Fallon, Illinois at the IHSA State Finals. <coughs> Congratulations to the Varsity and JV cheerleading teams for each taking first place at the CSL Championships last Thursday at Evanston. Varsity Cheer also won um, the Belvedere Invite Way to go Cougars. Uh, human Anatomy classes recently dissected brain they directed sheep brains as part of their nervous system unit, and students investigated the brains to see what a real-life visual of different components had been, that they had been studying. While many students complained about the smell, it was a very beneficial way to see a real-world application to their studies. Um, before this break, Dr. G and the school's environmental club hosted members of the Go Green Vernon Hills School Community and Solid Waste Agency of Lake County to begin initial plans to create a zero-waste initiative at Vernon Hills High School. The groups hope to introduce waste recycling procedures that will ultimately collect all food waste and recycle it through special containers. While this might have some increased cost to the district, the school believes that this is kind of a sustainability program and it's very important to our community and our world. We have an opportunity to see an example of this in our schools. On January 10th, um, the Senior Class Student Council partnered with um, the Varsity Blood Center of Illinois to sponsor a school-wide blood drive. 
and each period of the day, Vernon Hills mm -hmm. students 16 years and older and staff had the opportunity to donate blood and potentially save some lives. And we hope this event will spark some inspiration to people around the community to donate and help out with the current blood shortage. According to givingblood.org, someone needs blood every two seconds and 4.5 million Americans need a blood transfusion each year. Vernon Hills Blood Drive registered 107 donors and helped to save up to 219 lives with our donations. <coughs> On the 23rd, Vernon Hills hosted an orientation for the class of 2024 who are current 8th graders where they listened to a presentation in the auditorium about what they can expect next year at Vernon Hills and they were also able to see many of the clubs, sports, and extracurricular activities in the main gym where students, coaches, and club sponsors answered questions and handed out information for interested students to get involved. Um, National Honor Society students volunteered to show new families around the school and answer questions. <clears throat> Last week, students also completed the five essential survey before their second period class. The results of the survey are published along with the Illinois Department of Education school report card. This is one way that our school gets rated and ranked in comparison to other Illinois high schools. The survey is completely anonymous and no one will know the answers except for the students submitting their own survey. The more honest that students are, the better results um, we can get from the survey to help out the school. And it was administered by VH Give members as part of the VH Give Vision theme for the month. Students are currently in the process of choosing their classes for the upcoming school year and juniors are meeting one-on-one -on -one with their counselors to ensure that they have enough credits to graduate and be successful in their post-secondary pursuits. The Future Business Leaders of America Club with over 100 members competed at the area competition this month. It was held at the College of Lake County for the first time ever and the students enjoyed learning what it feels like to spend the day on a real college campus. Some categories included taking a test, giving a presentation, or doing an impromptu speaking event. Many of the members qualified to compete for the state competition, which will be held in Springfield, and everyone is very excited for that. On January 23rd, Vernon Hills hosted um, the Career Advisory Council. The council, with over 50 individuals representing 30 local businesses and agencies, met to hear about our school's business endeavors and ways that the community can be involved. Some of the meeting highlights include junior Zach Brandt, who shared his vision of developing a robust job shadowing program, and plans are underway to connect 150 interested students to local businesses so that the students can see firsthand what professionals in chosen careers do on a day-to-day -day basis. And students will travel to job shadowing locations on non-attendance school days. The first opportunities are scheduled for the March 2nd Institute Day. Also, junior Naranjan Kulkarni shared details of upcoming TED Tech Talks modeled after the popular TED Talks. Um, these ones will invite local business leaders into Vernon Hills to share stories of professional pathways and job-specific industry standards and skills. Students will have the opportunity to interact with these professionals in an authentic and meaningful way as they weigh their own educational track before they go off to college. Um, so yesterday the annual turnabout court was announced and the student body is greatly looking forward to the dance on February 22nd <coughs> with the theme of Generation Wildcat. Um, the Spanish three classes at LHS yeah, have been collecting calendars to donate to organizations in Nicaragua and we're so proud of their initiative and all that they have accomplished. The Latin program at LHS um, recently held a Latin theme night and a basketball game to encourage other students to sign up for Latin in the coming school year. Though the Latin community is small, they are very passionate about their program and would love to see more people join. And on that note, students are currently in the process of selecting their courses for the next academic school year. One of the most fun, fun days is coming up for a group of students at LHS going to Snowball this Thursday at Camp McLean in Wisconsin. It's a fun day full of activities and meeting new people. This year's theme is about being yourself and not changing who you are for other people. Moving on to clubs. Um, on Saturday, January 18th, the Thundercats, our fencing team, competed in the Great Lakes Junior Varsity Championship at Marion Central Catholic High School, where our men's and women's team competed in all three we weapons. Our own senior, Mary Kreshmar, um, placed third, and uh, freshman Jonah Roberts placed ninth. A huge congrats to the whole team. Um, a few other updates with clubs. Um, on January 18th, the debate team competed in the Palatine High School Tournament 
I want to congratulate freshman Nick and Gina for receiving fourth best speaker in the novice LD division, uh, Lincoln Douglas division, and sophomore Sarah Dowden for her finish as fifth best speaker in the JV Lincoln Douglas division. LHS Young Americans for Freedom organized a meetup to attend the March for Life in Chicago on January 11th, and similarly, Advocates <coughs> organized a, a group to attend the 2020, 2020 Women's March in the Chicago Week. On February 17th, after school, the club on January 17th, after school, they hosted a poster, a poster making party. Then on the morning of January 18th, all the participants took the metro downtown together, breaking the bitter cold. This Saturday, the LHS Science Olympiad group hosted invitationals. Ms. Ahern and Ms. Holder, the club advisors, ran the event, and a number of schools participated. Senior member Sunitra Kanan said that they got to spend a ton of quality time as a team, and the team is looking forward to the rest of the season. And last Friday, the LHS FBLA team was also able to participate in the tournament at CLC um, that included schools from the northern suburbs. The team was coached by Mrs. Odia and Mr. Goral, and the team was able to meet lots of people from local schools. <coughs> Over winter break, the marching band was able to travel down to Disney World for the Outback Bowl for college football for thousands of people to see. Marching band had so much fun and was able to play and meet high schools from all over America that were selected for this event. Congrats to them. The freshman sophomore play, Air Guitar High, is working super hard this week bringing the show together for their four shows on Thursday, Friday, Saturday of this weekend. Come see and support this super fun and crazy show this weekend. The IMEC conference in Peoria for select band, orchestra, and choir members is this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday where 13 students will represent LHS. We wish them luck for their performance on Saturday. The LHS Jazz Band has been so successful this year. They were able to perform at the North Shore Jazz Festival recently, where they placed third. This Thursday, they will be performing at the Illinois Music Education Conference in Peoria. We're so incredibly proud of all that they have accomplished. Forgesis um, performed at Barrington High School at, for their third year as a part of the Gus Giordano Choreography Project. Members of the Gus Giordano Dance Company choreo choreographed pieces for various orchestras companies in the area, and they all gathered on January 18th to perform. It's an exciting opportunity for all dancers to be able to work alongside professional dancers and to meet other dancers from other towns. The LHS Stage Players Club went to Theater Fest for the first weekend back from winter break. This festival is a time of fun for so many theater students and a fun small vacation. Students go and go out and get to see all state show, workshops, and other small shows that were brought to Illinois State University. Over winter break, into the first week of school coming back from winter break, six LHS students had finally performed in the all state cast of AIDA after six months of hard work at rehearsals um, performing at Illinois State University for the 2020 Theater Festival. LHS had two leads, Rachel Ernman as Admiris, Albert Sterner as Zozer, one ensemble member, Jason Sekili, one crew member, Maya Gabrilovic as assistant director, and two pit members, Noah Kublink as violin one, and Sarah Donofrio as keyboard two. LHS is super proud to have these six talented students in Allstate, especially because of how rare it is to have more than one to two students get in. Thank you. All right, great job, guys. Thank you. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah, you guys are welcome to stay. Um, as always. While I'm thinking about it, actually, one thing just for the board members, actually, I cannot, I won't be here for the next meeting in February. That also means I won't be here for lunch at a location at TBD. Um, so if, if before the end of the night, anybody wants to volunteer and go, just let me know, and then I can get the word to come. Okay? It'd be nice if one of us was all right, thanks everybody, great night. Okay, next. Um, uh, let's talk about the IASB uh, IASB joint conference. Yeah, can I yeah. set sure. a little context yeah. here? Um, because uh, sometimes there's some misinformation, particularly in the Chicago Tribune, that uh, once a year the Illinois Association of uh, School Boards, the Illinois Association of uh, School Administrators, which is a superintendent's group, um, the uh, Illinois Association of School Business Officials and even the IPA conduct what we call a joint conference or triple I conference in downtown. It's typically a couple of weekends before Thanksgiving uh, and roughly 12,000 school board members and uh, their administrators 
from around the state attend the conference in uh, Chicago. The conference is specifically designed for board member professional development. So there are um, you know, several keynote sessions, but uh, probably more importantly, uh, there are a number of breakout sessions for board members at many levels of board service. First year, veteran school board members, uh, and also a lot of sharing from school board members and administrators with other school board members and administrators. So it is the primary uh, driver of professional development for school board members around uh, the state. Our board has a long history of, of changes every year based on availability, but um, you know, one, two, five, or six school board members being able to attend uh, that conference. So we wanted the public to know that um, you know, our board has been active um, you know, in that conference, will continue to be active, uh, and I think finds value in that conference. So Dr. Grudy has asked the board members to share a couple of points from the breakout sessions they went to um, there, and it's important for the public to see that. Okay. Know that. Happy to start. And let, make, uh, sure, yeah, make sure you speak in <clears throat> front of the, the art of school boarding is uh, something that requires some effort. Um, so going to the conferences uh, helps helped me a great deal to make connections with other school board members, but also just to learn what it means to be on a school board. So it was funny that tonight, one of the things I went to was the uh, um, a session on school law. And uh, one of the things that they said was, um, you cannot ask for the name and address of people uh, right before they present for the board, which we did tonight. Uh, they also said we should have a timer uh, set up so that we can be sure that it's exactly three minutes, because if you don't, then you, by practice, have to allow additional time. You, have to be fair to you also have to keep the comments just in that section. And since I've been here, we've done it where we allowed comments to occur in the middle of the meeting. I was one of them. So uh, I don't see any reason for that here, but it, it's interesting how many other districts have such contentious school board meetings where there are people there who are angry. And I didn't see any of that tonight. We had a group of people here tonight that they had some right to be angry. And uh, they presented a, a cogent, well thought, uh, passioned uh, plea to the board, and, and they kept within their time limit, which I, I just thought that was great. Can I clarify one clear thing? You said we yeah. cannot ask for their name and address. No, I thought I thought we could ask, but we couldn't require it. Yeah, we you can't require. Yeah, you ask. I think you can ask, but you can't require. Correct. Right. So you can't say you can't speak to people having your name and address. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Oh, right. Exactly. All right. So but it's okay to say state your name and address to the record. So we refuse it. We say okay, fine, just keep going. Right. Is that all right? Well, actually, or, that that came up in conversation where they said uh, that that could put somebody at a disadvantage, where they would feel if they had to not to give or they didn't want to give their name and address, that that would set them apart. Yeah, um, I, just, I, I just think it's good if they will, because for all those people on the you know watching sure. the tape, at least you know okay, well these are people. From, from Libertyville that have an issue that they want to air, that's fine. You know? Sure. Um, obviously, if somebody doesn't, I, I'm okay with it. Right. It used to be we actually made them do that. Um, well, okay every, every school board did it back yeah. in the day, and I think that's evolved through uh, apparently legal challenges. Thing anymore, I think. Right. But just so to clear, the just clear I'm looking sure. at our distinguished counsel down the end of the table. I'm not aware of there being a prohibition from asking for their address. Okay. Um, it, it wasn't seen, that they said it was a prohibition. They said that we shouldn't ask for it. Well, and, and I think that's of what course the, they have the right to refuse. Okay. Right. So, and, and I, I, think, I just want to make sure I'm not doing, I'm not doing something I'm not supposed to And do. what I've no. seen is, um, in what town do you live in? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. More okay. general than sure. the specific address. Okay, and that's fine. Then maybe that's a great great change. I mean, not that it really matters that you live in Vernon or Liverpool, but I guess to me it's nice to know that they're from one of our two towns, and I right. guess that's all I'm looking for. I'm not, you know, I'm interested in what they have to say, maybe a little less so if they come from 50 miles away. They just right. Have, they come and share Which they can. can. Yes. Yes. They just have a right to do that. We've had uh, a few of those in yes, the past. Yes, we have. I also went to a three hour session on school finance. Um, and uh, all I could think of the whole time was how grateful I am that we have you. So thank you. Because the whole time I'm like, Dan understands that. Dan is like, I'm trying to understand it. 
and you know, you go through it a few times, it's not enough. It's just something that goes on again and again. Um, but after a while, you get used to hearing things like PTEL and having a sense of what that means rather than really having to. Again. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I also went to a, a session on cyberbullying and something called sextortion, which I had never heard before. Um, it's a uh, an officer. Uh, I brought this for you so that you can. It's here somewhere, uh, so that you guys can look this over. But he uh, he headed up a task force with the FBI, um, catching people who prey on high school students. And what they do is a little bit at a time, they get some person to reveal something about themselves until they get to a leveraging point. And then once they get to the leveraging point, then the real pressure starts. And they might have hundreds of people that they're working on simultaneously. Any one person might have hundreds that they're extorting. Um, what they said was, in every case in the United States, which I thought was interesting, the one thing that all cyber bullies or bullying and sextortion cases have in common is that the victim had access to their phone or computer at night after the parents were asleep. If there was any one thing that a parent was going to do, it would be to take their kid's phone and computer away at nighttime. Let them go to bed, but that's my alarm. I'll buy you an alarm clock. But that's, the, the things that they showed in that session were astounding. Um, and there's a couple of links in there for some uh, uh, practice training sessions. They come to school districts. They, of course, they're selling a product, but uh, I, I, I was surprised by it. <coughs> so that's enough for me. Um, I attended the school finance session as well. And to echo what Don said, I'm just grateful that we have Dan available to us because he is always willing to spend time explaining <coughs> how our district finances have functioned in the past, how they operate today, how the state of Illinois operates with finances. Um, it, it never hurts to get refresher on that. The more you hear it, the more you understand it and absorb it. Um, the evidence-based funding is a big, a big nut to get your arms around in terms of understanding. Um, and the guys that presented it did a great job. And it's always very um, eye-opening to spend time with folks from other districts. And we realize how fortunate we are here and how well we have managed our finances here in District 128. So thank you to everyone who's been here before me um, and to Dan for all your hard work on that. Uh, I also attended a half-day session called Attention Pays run by Neen James, if you've ever heard of her before. Um, put her book on your reading list, because she is a firecracker. I mean, I have never had an, a session fly by so fast and been like, wait, no, we can't be done. She is was just so much fun to listen to. And really, the whole session centered around how to drive productivity by unplugging from, from the things that distract your attention and harnessing the things that, that grab your attention. It sounds very simplistic, but she's got a whole matrix and a, a real way of presenting it so it really gets you thinking. Uh, so, and like I said, I'm not here to plug her book. She actually did not tell me to do that, but. <laughs> uh, and then I attended a te uh, session of, uh, about Teach the Teacher. Uh, talking about how teacher mentoring programs, I just kind of wanted to get a little um, more view on how teachers talk to each other and how do they mentor each other. Uh, and I found that to be very productive and interesting. So all in all, it is always a very, very uh, worthwhile exercise attending the school board conference. So. OK. Um, in addition to it being this great conference for these three, these three organizations during this process, uh, and as our district's representative to the Illinois Association of School Boards, they have what they call their delegate assembly, which is their major annual meeting um, with one representative from every member district in the state attending. And there's two things that we do. is basically a, a business meeting for the association, um, a vote on officers, you know, and changes in bylaws, that kind of thing. But the, the major thing that we do there is to, to vote on uh, resolutions, and those resolutions are, are issues and um, information to that that the association can use as a guiding principles for 
uh, when they discuss things with uh, the legislature, when they discuss things with the um, uh, State Board of Education, those kinds of things. So it's sort of their, their uh, belief statements on uh, various legislation that might be pending, that type of thing. So we vote on those. There was one that was uh, pretty contentious, as it was the year before, and that was allowing um, uh, the, the concept of allowing a, a teacher or an educator or a staff member to uh, carry a weapon in the school uh, building as protection to um, uh, for them and for the, the students, and um, that did not support for that concept did not pass. So for the second year in a row. So I don't know if we're going to hear much more about that in the future, but there's there's dozens and dozens of these resolutions that we, we review and vote on. So that was uh, a, a portion of one of my days was spent uh, representing us on that uh, in that meeting. In addition to that, I hit a mix of things in a, uh, two of the, the three keynotes, which were great. Um, I went to one on uh, what will the, the spring legislation, legislative session bring. Uh, at that and after that, I got to meet with uh, uh, with now Senator uh, Robert Bartwick, uh, who, as a representative, uh, about a year ago, introduced uh, House Bill 3606, which is something that was uh, of importance to me. This is uh, adjustments to the uh, the. Uh, Online, the Student Online Protection Act, um, and there were some major changes in that, that, and House Bill 3606 was passed and signed by the governor over the summer, so I was able to uh, to uh, chat with him a little bit about that and uh, and actually thank him for some of his support on some of the issues that, that uh, we were interested in regarding uh, HB 3606. Uh, I attended, um, in support of our one of our center districts, um, Dr. Bonnie Lemon uh, presented on uh, renovating older buildings. So that was an interesting uh, session that I, I attended to help my Oak Grove uh, folks and see what they were up to. I also attended one selfishly uh, from uh, Fenton High School District 100, which is where I happen to spend my days during the day in my day gig. Um, and uh, a number of our administrators were presenting our uh, success in uh, achieving the uh, Advanced Placement District of the Year this past year. So uh, we got to uh, do that and met with a ton of people. There's an exhibit for, a huge exhibit for, where I learned quite a bit about uh, some new educational technology. There's a great bookstore that I always try to spend a little bit of time in and pick up a new book uh, or two. Uh, each year, and then just running into tons of present, current, former colleagues, uh, former classmates, uh, various uh, programs and whatnot. So it's just, it's a great opportunity to network with people from all over the state uh, and really get different perspectives on what it means to be a school board member and how we can uh, uh, do this great work to help improve our schools and, and really support public education. Okay, um, so I actually uh, spent uh, a good part of the first day at the Safety and Security Seminar, which was really quite good. And the first presentation was done by Paul Tim, who I believe we've been doing some work with. Oh, great. Yeah, he was really good, and he, you know his focus was on a lot of the nuts and bolts of school security. I'll call it the hardware side of the business. Um, use of magnetometers and door locks and, and a lot of that stuff. So I think he had a lot of good things to say. Um, and, and I certainly look forward to some follow-up on the work that he's done with us. The second part, a guy named Nick uh, Chernoff was more of an IT um, social media guy. Uh, and it really opened my eyes to what's out there um, and what Ken and, and is done with, say, Snapchat and, and Google and all that. Um, I'm amazed at how, how much information is out there that I really don't think people know. Um, and so they talked a lot about some of the searches, image searches you can do and stuff, both proactively and, and as part of investigations and things like that. Really trying to look for, um, I'll call it bad behavior, uh, in the community somewhat proactively. So that was very idle. Um, and, and it caused me to appreciate a lot of the things that I think, you know, Mick and his team and our resource officers do and, and, and get involved in. So that was really, it was quite good. Then the third part of that was done by um, Frank DeAngelis, who was the principal at Columbine in mm -hmm. uh, 1996. Um, 
as you know during the Columbine disaster. So that was that was a very moving um, presentation. Uh, talked about all the students and what it was like in the community following that disaster. So that was kind of a reality check for everybody that um, left everybody quite moved, I would say. Um, then I attended one on uh, pension caps, salaries, buyouts, and budgets. Just kind of curious um, what's going on there. Um, so one thing that I did learn, I guess the tier two pension system is um, maybe underfunded is not the right word, but at risk of uh, generating enough income to meet the threshold. There's a threshold that it's got to pay out at least what Social Security does. And if it doesn't, we're all kind of on the hook for it. Have to fix it. Yeah, so they, they got to fix that. I, I think the tone in the room was they're going to find a way to fix that. But, you know, at least at this point, there's some risk there, um, I would there's, say. There's a significant risk there. Yeah, and, and to put that in context, that's not a situation where um, I'll call it, uh, I don't want to use the word, I guess we use the word excessive just because that's what's in the, in, the, in the paper all the time. Excessive pension benefits are breaking the system. That's one where the benefit, pension benefits aren't even meeting what Social Security would provide. Okay. Right. And that's the minimum threshold, that, as I understand it, that it has to do. So I wasn't aware of that. That was, that was quite interesting. Um, pension cost shift discussions are continuing. So just because you haven't read it in the Tribune or the Daily Herald recently, um, that discussion, I think, is still happening. You may know more about that with some of your recent discussions. Um, and then, of course, the focus of that discussion is, and if it does happen, um, there's no reason to believe that that wouldn't have to be covered within the limits of the current tax caps. Okay, so that's got a lot of people scrambling. And again, in a bigger picture context, I, like you, spent a lot of my time there thinking about how fortunate we are um, because it's one thing for us to try to adjust and cover for some of these things. It is a completely different thing for a lot of the smaller and especially down, downstate districts to do it. Um, Saturday morning, I went to the general session. I don't know if anybody else went to it. Matt Mayberry. Um, this was that was quite it was really good. I've seen him before. He was excellent. Um, you know, I knew he was an ex Chicago Bear, but I didn't know his story. Um, turns out he is a recovered drug addict. At age 16, he was this phenomenal athlete that became a drug athlete almost threw his entire life away. Uh, long story short, he recovered um, through a lot of very challenging circumstances, uh, became a Chicago Bear, you know, fulfilled his life's dream. Uh, and I think he went into one game, got injured, his whole career was over. Um, so he basically gave a great presentation on the ups and downs of life and things like that. But he was very, there were, there were I would say, a couple thousand people in the room for that presentation. Yeah, there's, it was great. So he was selling his book. He was pushing his book, too. I bought it. <laughs> I was so moved by it, I couldn't help it. Um, but he was, it was a very powerful presentation. And one, one of his great lines that I liked was, he said, you are who you hang out with. Uh, and I've always said that. I always said to my kids when they grew up, I said, you're all, always welcome to come to my house, because I wanted to see who they were hanging out with. But he just felt fundamentally, he became who he was, including the drug addict, because that's who he was hanging out with hanging out with him. I mean, he, and he used that line over and over again, you know, when he was trying to get fixed, but he kept hanging out with drugs and drug people. And, and that just made it that much harder to, to recover. So it was a great, um, great presentation. I uh, went to another one, Current Trends of Collective Bargaining. I know we just finished our contract, but I was just kind of curious what was going on out there. Um, the most, the majority of that presentation was kind of something that I got the feeling that they present every year, which is our years with collective bargaining is. It was a lot of time spent on, um, uh, unfair labor practices and things to be aware of. So uh, that was informative. Uh, but in terms of trends, um, I think there, they mentioned there was a trend towards slightly longer contracts. They did mention uh, in a lot of the districts what they're trying to do to cover now the minimum salary increase that the state's been passing. And so again, you could appreciate in the smaller districts and the downstate districts, they're not in a position of actually finding a way to get more money for that. They're talking about how they move money from benefits to salary. Um, so big challenges for, for a lot of those districts. Um, uh, and then there was some discussion about the move back from 3% uh, caps on uh, retirement increases to 6% and what the impacts are on existing contracts and new contracts. Um, so that's interesting too. Then two, two last things. One, um, really good presentation by a district on strategic planning. I know we talked about this briefly in committee. Um, but these guys did a great job. And in particular, they created a plan with goals in the areas of student achievement, program services and curriculum was, a, was another pillar, facilities, finances, and then district and community relations. Uh, and they did a really nice job. That was actually one of the better presentations that I, I saw in terms. You could really see they, they had nothing and they created something out of nothing. And I think they did a really nice job. 
Uh, last but not least, I also mentioned this at the committee, but the President's Roundtable, um, that was really quite interesting. I would say round numbers, there were at least 50 of us there. Um, and everybody broke out. They asked for a list of topics that um, everybody wanted to talk about. We're going to break out into like round tables of 10. Um, but by far the two biggest, in fact, we had to open up a second table on this, was how to deal with a problematic board member. Right? So, as I mentioned, it, no, it, was, it, was, it was such an eye-opening experience the whole weekend in terms of appreciating you know, the greater good of all the things that we have in this district. But I, I know I left that last conversation on a slightly more micro level definitely having a greater appreciation for all of you. If I didn't already have a very good one, I, I left there with an even better one. <laughs> because some of the issues, I, I decided I would sit at that table um, before they opened the second one. I said, I'm thinking to myself, well, we don't have those problems. Maybe I can help. Um, and I really did try to help them. <laughs> it was pretty interesting. Like, well, did you try to just listen to them? Um, and, and, you know, <laughs> do you know how to paraphrase so that they at least feel like they've been hurt? Um, but it, it was it was much bigger than that. I mean, we're, we're talking like personal attacks on each other. And, oh, and I, I was just like, I'm walking out of there going, oh boy, um, very different world. So thank you to all of you, including the two that are not here. Um, for your patience, understanding, and you know, collective wisdom, because it, it really does make a difference. Like I was, I was amazed how that was like the topic. The second biggest one was what do you do with a um, problematic community member? Sort of in the same vein, um, but out of house. Um, so that was fun. But it was, it was, it was actually really good. And there's, there's talk about trying to figure out how to get together a little bit more often than just once a year in this thing. We'll see what, what happens then. All right. But overall, very, very productive couple of days. <coughs> Um, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible since we've kind of gone down the line. And I, I, the only thing that I would like to repeat is how worthwhile it is as a board member to go to this type of event because other than the para training and the Open Meetings Act, we really don't do any professional development. Um, so I appreciate the fact that we get to do this and I appreciate we, that we have a community that supports us coming together once a year. Um, we do a bit of bonding as a team, um, but we really do get to pay attention to issues that we wouldn't otherwise have exposure to, so I appreciate that. The other thing I think is worth repeating is Prentice and every one of you sitting down this line, um, you are the best at what you do. And I thank you on behalf of a grateful board. Our district gets the results that we do because of every single one of you. Well, on behalf of us, I'm going to say wow. And uh, thank you um, very much and right back at all of you. Thank you. Because well, it, it takes all of us working together for to sure. get where we're at and where we're headed. Right. And that, that could not be more true. I want to finally echo what Pat said. We have a fabulous board. And I know I might seem biased, but I'm one of the two people that had a trial period of being appointed before I was forced uh, through the barrier of entry of having to run for a seat on the board, which I'm very glad that I did. Because did she said forced. She said, did she say forced? She said It's the election <laughs> part that you're forced, it's the barrier to entry. Okay. And I am so glad that I had the trial period before I had to decide whether or not to run for the board because for me, that election process was very um, off-putting and uh, seeing the, the group that I was going to be participating with made that worth it. Um, we are so fortunate when we go to these conferences, not only do we see the great diversity and get to appreciate um, how multifaceted our state is and put into context our experience as a school board, but we also do get to see a lot of the problems that are very typical and we are by far the exception that we have such a dedicated, um, ideologically diverse but um, committed to the right thing, which is the success of students in our district. Um, so I'm very grateful for my fellow board members. Nobody here is with an issue. Um, nobody here talks to hear themselves talk, except for maybe me right now. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, You're doing fine. You're doing great. And everybody really does listen to each other and has a different perspective. So we, we really are so fortunate in this district. And, and that perspective would be worth it by itself to attend. Um, the two uh, breakout sessions that I that, that were notable, uh, both Karen Lundstedt and I attended the equity uh, uh, breakout session, and that was really interesting. Um, gave us a chance to think about some things that we wouldn't normally think about, um, and to workshop some different ideas uh, with people from around the state, which was a very valuable experience. Um, 
and then any takeaways that from that I think Karen and I could always talk about further in committee. Um, and then uh, there was one on school construction. The byline of that was bigger is not always better. And as we undertake capital improvement projects in our district, I was very interested to hear how two different school districts approached uh, building needs without necessarily um, going bigger. Um, and that, that was very enlightening and it was a whole different sort of paradigm to think about how to meet your um, structural needs um, while still being very mindful of your uh, of your footprint both financially and ecologically. So that, that was a very good uh, breakout session. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to attend. It's, it's always very worthwhile. Great. Okay. But thanks everybody for, for spending as much time as you did. And I was uh, in some cases almost three days. And Pat, before you, uh, we actually hook over to my report, I guess this may have been lead in. Um, I want to say again for the community, I've been in this district for 15 years and we've had several iterations of the board over the years, of course, as people do their service and then they move on. And uh, I can tell you, we have had the most incredible, effective school boards over that period of time. And so to the point, I always try and tell you, not enough probably, uh, but it's important I think for the community to hear that Again, the level of success in terms of ultimately kids being more successful in this district, healthy, happy, and successful uh, in this district is the result of vertical and horizontal alignment. So if we're looking vertically, that would be the school board, district building administration, teachers, support staff, our incredible students, of course, and the communities that support us and provide us the resources. Um, we have only been able to maximize, Don, we just had this discussion, we've only been able to maximize our success in this district over a long period of time because of that alignment, right? And to all of your points, the thing I love about this board his, historically here is the more complex the subject, the deeper and richer our conversations are. And that diversity of opinion is welcomed at the table. Somebody always plays the gatekeeper and the result of that conversation is that we make good decisions and we rarely make mistakes and blow one, right? As a result of that of collective wisdom. So we really, speaking on behalf of all of us, and of course the teachers and the support staff, uh, we really appreciate you. And I know from my years in the business that we are where we're at and we continue to go as evidenced by these amazing kids tonight in these two presentations. Um, because we also have a great school board. Okay, so thank you on behalf of all of us for your commitment to the mission of the district. There's two last comments. One, so related to that, um, and in the spirit of what we try to do here, uh, what would the interest level be in having a conversation at the board level? Maybe we used to do a board workshop. Remember that? A couple, several years ago, we did that. I'm not going to propose that we do that on a Saturday morning. We got together for half a day or a day with, I think we did with Jim. The salt today, Jim. Yeah. Um, I'm not proposing we do that, but we could spend a half an hour, an hour just talking a little bit about how things are going, what are we doing well, what can we do better. I mean, I don't want to just assume that everybody's sitting there saying, wow, that's great. Uh, what do you guys think? Is it, when we try to fit that into an existing meeting, whether we did that as a committee, the whole meeting, or however the right way to do it. But right. if interest, we'll figure it out. It's um, a pretty good operating question, just that we could ask every month how, how are we you know how's it going how are we doing and we've got time that we can have those conversations without probably maybe artificially building it in yeah. okay well and I, I i thank you for your um, optimism that we would be able to have any conversation and hold it to 30 to 60 minutes uh, i was struggling with that <laughs> that was more naivety but that's okay but we do have coming up uh, so the policy is a self-evaluation <laughs> Right. Yeah. So I no, think that's... as part of our policy, it's time for us to get some iteration of that on the calendar and perhaps as an, either that will cover what you're getting at or some outcropping of our self-evaluation will be some type of periodic conversation that has a, a point and a time limit and um, gets us to be better board members and better at serving the community. Okay, any thoughts on that side? Yes, I like it. Let's go. All right, so we'll, 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 we'll be think about that and try to figure out how we want to do it. Yeah. Okay. And if you if you get a if you get a, a 
for lack of a better word, a kind of a structure or a process that that regularly happens. Because remember, next April, we're going to have really the first significant board turnover that we've had for a while. And so we're going to welcome some new board members to the table. And it will be easier if we just have something that's kind of natural in place that is just kind of part of how we operate as newer board members come on. So it's all good. Yeah, we can work with you on that for we sure. That as a yeah, for sure. Yeah, let's, if that. we could do that in March, because I'm not here in February, I'd like to be part of that conversation. Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. It's hard to believe in March. Because once March comes, the rest of the school year just flies by. Yeah, All right, very, very quickly. Okay. Um, now, just one second before you go. I'm just going to uh, grab water. Yeah, okay. Uh, I meant to mention while the kids were still here, because they mentioned the, the green thing. Um, go, what was it? Uh, go green kind of thing. I don't know if we brought them up to speed on the conversation we had in the last committee meeting, mm -hmm. right, and that initiative. So whoever does attend lunch might want to just mention that. Well, we could talk. Tom and John will be there. Yeah, we, we wanted to give the, the students the uh, building administration an opportunity to talk to each other first before yeah. we went out. So, so, all right, so in that regard. Yeah, just with the kids. He was yeah. talking about bringing the kids in. In that regard, school. let's hope that you guys can have that conversation, make sure maybe they're already aware of it. Um, Never hurts for the board member sitting at the sure. lunch table to reinforce it. Yep. Okay. Excellent. So, so and the I, kids, I can assure you, they'll be all in. Yes. Yeah. So, no, no, they're, they're all. Yeah. I, I, again, that to me is an opportunity. We said we heard yeah. you. We agree yeah. with it. We're on it. They'll be all okay. in. Because the worst thing we can do is have them speak, you know, month after month, nod our heads, and do nothing. Okay. Now, I think all of us in the business world have probably been to countless sessions of varying kinds where. How many task forces and committee, committees and consultants did you work with that when they left, it was back to the way it always was? Right? I always used to tell people they go to a conference like the tri conference. I think I told you some of these things of like leadership conference and stuff like that. I always ask people, what was the most important day? And they're trying to figure out if it was like Monday through Friday, they're trying to figure out if it's Monday through Tuesday, Monday through Friday. And I'd always say, it's next Monday. And they just kind of look at me like, next Monday? We're not going to be here. I go, I know. <laughs> You're going back to your desk, all right? And you coming out of here all energized and excited about all the great stuff, because usually with those conferences where we're trying to just sit back, reflect, and think about what's going on. But then when you go back on Monday, the business as usual, you know, your desk stuff, that's when it really matters, okay? Um, yeah, I'm getting a message from uh, board member Huber. Uh, it's coming through the oh, atmosphere. And? Uh, he wants everyone to know, uh, especially Don, that the oh, Wildcats yeah. have defeated the uh, Stevenson Patriots tonight. Uh, that's especially Don. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, that's, I'm, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm picking it up. And he's on his way. I was going to say, does that mean he's on his way? I don't know about that. That, that, that is Don coming through. So okay. that's uh, that is great news. Great news. Wor a worthy update. Thank you. Yeah. So, go Excellent news. Great. And Kevin's right where he should Don, be. Don's showing his new colors here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, we're working. We're okay. very good friends as the coach, so. Oh, yeah. we still be friends. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Super good. Good reason for you to connect. You can yeah. say, hey, I'm really sorry about, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. That's all right, here we go. Uh, a little bit more good news uh, tonight. Uh, first on January 4th, uh, seven District 128 Special Olympians competed at the area winter games in snowshoeing at Hoffman Estates High School. Uh, four athletes qualified for the state winter games in Galena February 4th to 6th by taking home gold medals in their respective races. Congratulations to the following athletes. Nathan Ferrara, gold in the 200 mat, uh, meter, uh, gold in the 100 meter. Uh, Noah Hewitt, silver in the 200 meter, bronze in the 100 meter. Haley Dunbar, gold in the 100 meter, silver in the 50 meter. Joseph Mahler, Gold in the 50 meter, silver in the 100 meter. Sean Karanen, silver in the 100 meter, bronze in the 50 meter. Drew McCarthy, gold in the 100 meter, silver in the 50 meter. Alex Aquende, uh, bronze in the 50 meter, and fifth place in the 100 meter. Alex Aquende, Haley Dunbar, Sean Karanen, and Drew McCarthy were fourth place in the 4x100 relay. On, January, on Sunday, January 12th, the Special Olympians competed at the area basketball tournament at Hersey High School, which happens to be John Gilliam's alma mater. Uh, both uh, teams finished second, taking home silver medals. Congratulations to our athletes. On the Storm Blue team, Mackenzie Rundke, uh, Regiana uh, Bencott, Johnny O'Connor, Sean Karanen, Haley Dunbar, Daniel Granados, Alvina Gisa, 
and Noah Hewitt. Uh, Storm Black team was Nathan Ferrara, Alexa Donato, uh, Anna Scholler, Chris Morosin, um, Chase Miller, Anthony Burkhold, and Joseph Mahler. VHHS senior Justina Chua uh, and her team won the Congressional App Challenge in Illinois District 3 for her app Habit At, or Ampersand, which helps educate users on sustainable habits and gamifies habit tracking. It's very interesting. That could be a good tie-in for us. She and her team were selected winners by Congressman Dan Lipinski and are now invited to um, Ampersand House of Code Capitol Hill Reception in Washington, D.C. to discuss their app with leaders from Congress, the administration, and the private sector. They will also have the opportunity to connect with sponsors, partners, and community organizers and get interviewed by Habit At. Habit At will be displayed in the U.S. Capitol Building and on House.gov. She was also awarded $250 in Amazon Web Services credits. That's pretty incredible. Uh, and uh, two uh, staff, uh, good news pieces, former staff, retired LHS Athletic Director Tim Albers has been selected to join the Illinois Athletic Directors Hall uh, Association Hall of Fame Class of 2020. Tim will be inducted at the IADA Hall of Fame Banquet on May 2nd at the Embassy Suites in East Peoria. Tim uh, was here a number of years as Brian's predecessor as athletic director and is one of the great ones um, in the field. Retired LHS, LHS teacher and coach Dale Christensen has been selected to join the Illinois High School Football Coach, Coaches Association Hall of Fame Class of 2020. Dale will be inducted in late March at the IHFCA Banquet. Uh, and again, congratulations to both Tim and Dale. Okay, um, so that concludes uh, the good news report. Uh, Mark, I'll just do the 30-second version of the LHS in the interest of time, and if you want to add on. Uh, LHS main gym repair work, as the board knows and the community should know, uh, we've completed the work uh, on uh, replacing the original painted metal ductwork uh, in the gymnasium, which has created some problems for us over the last couple of years. Uh, special thanks to Mark, uh, who did just an amazing uh, job of working with contractors and making it all happen in a very short period of time, uh, and his staff for rearranging things over the winter break so we could get that all done. Um, we've also received two pieces, maybe a couple pieces of better news. As the board knows, um, part of maybe a part two and a part three of that project was to look at the existing uh, painted metal ceiling panels. Uh, that are all across the gym and the two or three exposed steel beams which hold up the roof which are also painted. Uh, Mark working uh, with a specialist contractor I actually did some analysis of the remaining paint in the gym and what we have what they really discovered is there is only trace amounts of uh, lead way under what you know the EPA and uh, uh, other groups uh, would consider dangerous. Uh, under uh, the paint on the ceiling panels and the beams. They did find um, higher lead uh, amounts of lead paint on the lentils, the steel lentils over the three main doorways. Uh, however, those are covered by regular paint, have never peeled or have ever been exposed. So the good news here is that it appears what we thought we might uh, originally have to do was to look at replacing those panels and then sandblasting those beams down to bare metal and then repainting them. The result of not having to do that is probably in the neighborhood of at least a million plus dollars um, in terms of having to do that. It also means if we have some additional peeling in the gym, we're not gonna have to shut down the whole gym and do abatement. We're gonna be able to repair that area and then move on uh, with life, okay? So that's really good news. So, so again, thanks to Mark for taking that next step before we moved forward You know, with maybe a second and third phase of, of that project. Um, Mark, anything else on that? Uh, no, no. Okay, so that rolls right into, as a great segue into capital projects. Capital update. projects update. Um, so, thank you, Dan. Uh, over here at Vernon Hills, uh, moving forward with the addition, um, we, uh, they poured the uh, topping for the floors. Uh, on the second and third floor. 
Um, they have interior walls going up and door frames are in place upstairs, so they're starting to put the masonry up there. So uh, moving forward, uh, it's starting to shape up. Uh, and you can see actual you know, rooms coming together. Um, so uh, working through that other site. Um, over here in the, uh, in the gym uh, in addition, the dance studio, they have the, the south wall and the uh, west walls up. And now they're moving uh, towards the inside to uh, do the bearing walls. Uh, there's two walls that need to be uh, installed inside uh, the structure. We'll leave a section of the building open so they can uh, get a crane in and also get the uh, trusses in. And we'll work our way out and then close that one section up and set the last few trusses. So uh, in the next uh, month or so, we should see that happen. Uh, all depending on the weather, and the weather's been uh, cooperating uh, as far as temperatures for us to move forward. Mark, in big picture, what's the timing looking like overall? So, if we look at classrooms, we want those ready by next August. The, the classrooms and the um, cafeteria, we want, we want to for <laughs> beginning school, and we know we have the delays because of the underground piping that we ran into, you yeah. know, trying to find it, locate it, make yeah. sure we had everything. Uh, in place structurally to hold the building together. But are we still feeling good about August for the classrooms? Yes, we're still feeling good. Um, uh, we're um, meeting uh, more, and, and John uh, Gillio and I have talked, um, and um, so they could we come up with a plan. If we feel that we're not going to make it, then John will structure his, his uh, uh, classroom scheduling around um, where we're at with the scheduling on the and the academic way. So, for, for next, you know, for next fall. So, priority so, one is cafeteria. Cafeteria has to be done. Yeah, the cafeteria. Class, the, the classrooms we have been talking about for a while, like we always would. What is plan B at the start of school if we don't have the classrooms? So, we will have a plan B if the classrooms are not done uh, right at the start of school. We will be able to accommodate students, still have all our classes, and do what we need to do until. They're open, so we have to do that contingency planning, of course, because even if we thought they were going to be done, and then for some reason they're not done, and we don't have a plan, then yeah. we can't have class. So we've been. Is it likely that plan will be a change in the curriculum, or just a change in where we yeah. house people? Yeah, just a change in where they how we class. We're not going to have to cut sections or. Do oh no 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 no! It's, it's just a yeah. scheduling the room space. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, so it's a logistical but, problem. So we, we meet uh, weekly with uh, John and his staff in, in the construction, and um, yeah. that, that that weekly meeting has been going great. Uh, great suggestions uh, from John and his staff, um, and okay. making accommodations for us to move forward so we knock those little things out, so we have plenty of. Uh, um, Staffing to complete the critical things, you know, when, when it comes to that point. When, you know, okay, and the, the gym won't be August. I can tell we're looking at that. But oh, what's the next so critical need. time by which we feel we need the gym? Uh, and are we on track it, for that? So Winter. our Winter. So we, we would want that, time time that gym for sure ready by the time fall athletics end okay. and winter kick up because that's really as as we shared in our reports okay. leading into it, you know, that kicks off That's our really true. busy season indoors, obviously, when the weather turns into it. So, um, there's really not a good plan B when you're a gym short. Yeah. Right? So, right. Yeah. so that we can figure out how to make yeah. So, that's, we're looking at a Halloween date for that. At the okay. Latest, but uh, hopefully in before that. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, over at Libertyville, um, things are really shaping up. Excited for you guys to see it at the uh, next meeting. We've got drywall up and uh, dance studio. And another hard hat tour. Another, another hard hat tour. tour. Awesome. Um, things are really coming together. Big pictures. Uh, moving forward. So um, you can really see how it's going to look now. So yeah. awesome. ceiling, ceiling grid is up. You know, there's a couple of the sections are up. They're installing the the sleek trim lighting that goes in the grid work, and yeah, you'll be amazed when you see you know, how it looks. Because the last time you were there a couple months ago, they had just taken the bottom vessel out. Yeah. And I mean, really, that's what was up when we were there. So it'll be pretty cool to see that. So we'll do that before 
you know, the start of our committee meetings next month. We'll send you pictures. I'll stop by during the week. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay, Mark, is that good? That's good. Okay. Uh, next up, actually, we can take uh, four and five, and uh, Jim and I can just, again, for the lateness of the evening, come back in more detail. Um, the Illinois Spring Legislative Session is coming up, so uh, this time of year, over a period of a month, I uh, start to connect with legislators that I've worked with, not only in our area, but throughout the state, um, and, and um, reconnect with them and then connect with our new legislators. So, uh, Representative Mary Edley Allen is a representative kind of up in the Libertyville area. And then uh, Dan uh, Dedick is the representative. Uh, she replaced Carol Senti down in the southern end of our district. Carol did such a terrific job um, for us. And then uh, Senator Terry Link is the state senator for uh, Vernon Hills. And then Dan McConkey is for kind of Liberty Bow Walk on and down to Barrington. And uh, I will tell you all of our legis and also for us, I do a lot of work with Senator Senator Melinda Bush, who's in Grace Lake. She's a terrific uh, legislator. Um, and then uh, several other legislators in the area. So our Lake County group actually works together and across the aisle pretty effectively for the benefit of Lake County. Um, and so they've reiterated that again. So here are some of the things in the spring session that are going to relate to public schools that are going to be very important for us to follow and engage in conversation. Property taxes, PTEL, this would all be relief and reform. Uh, property tax relief and reform, PTEL, which Don mentioned earlier, is actually tax caps. Reform, TIF reform. Uh, the longest TIFs right now are 23 years. 23 years we're not getting additional taxes from that so the legislators are well aware of that school uh, consolidation is going to be on the radar as part of that conversation uh, what we heard from Senate President Cullerton last night is that the actual the pension cost shift is that conversation is maybe dying down a little bit uh, because it got pushed pretty heavily for a couple of years so we'll have to see uh, where where that goes and then uh, un- and underfunded mandates, of course, which is always an, an issue um, for us. Uh, the killer with uh, looking at property tax relief and reform, which you all agree needs to happen, is that the majority of funding for public schools in this state, particularly in a district like ours, comes from property taxes. So um, the legislators clearly understand that um, if you're going to do some kind of property tax relief and reform, you're going to have to find an additional state funding source to have an offset uh, of that revenue. So um, along with the constitutional amendment in the fall on graduated income tax, which the governor has said a lot of that money will be dedicated to um, public education. So I think all of those things are going to be in tow um, in the uh, uh, conversation. Uh, Jim and I attended the 49th annual Ed Red uh, legislative dinner for our community members. Ed Red is the Chicago Suburban Advo Public Education Advocacy and, and Lobbying Group. Uh, they do a terrific job for us. And uh, as I noted, uh, Senator Culler, former Senator Culler, Tim Dow, uh, has been a great supporter of public education, was the keynote speaker last night and also did probably 25 minutes or half an hour of Q&A. Uh, when we got done, and I, I thought it was a great evening. And Pat will not believe me when I say this, we were done at 7.35. Yeah, that's hard for me to believe. Okay, because usually we're walking out the door there at 9.30, okay? So, Jim, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else about that, about the dinner last night, but uh, I thought... Um, no, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a great organization. I guess I got sort of hooked on it a, a few years back at the encouragement of... Uh, Dr. Lee and actually last year wound up sitting on one of their ad hoc uh, committees uh, and surprised them last night by saying, oh yeah, I've been on another ad hoc committee this year that he didn't know I was part of. He told me. I was part of the finance ad hoc committee. And those are groups that, that work with Ed Red to, to sort of set um, uh, our view, our vision of, of uh, what they should be um, looking at from uh, in terms of supporting public education down in Springfield. Uh, on behalf of uh, the, the north north suburban area, I guess, is, uh, is their sort of geographic, north and northwest. So, no, it's a great, great event. And you get to 
meet with so many of the legislators and, and really be able to talk face to face and, and uh, get their read on things and let them hear you. Okay. Uh, if there are not any questions on that, we have a donation acknowledgement this evening. And uh, this is for Mr. G uh, James Pardun uh, in Lake Zurich. Letter is to verify that uh, Mr. Pardun donated a 2008 uh, Honda Odyssey four door sport van uh, to Vernon Hills High School. Um, it was a free will donation and no money was received by us, the donor. The vehicle will be used at Vernon Hills High School campus by the Auto Tech class and will be junked once it is of no further use. So we want to thank Mr. Pardon for his uh, donation to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that is Jim. I want to make sure that I had not been his father, father, right? Um, or a distant cousin. And uh, we had one FOIA request uh, this month uh, since last meeting. Uh, FOIA commercial request received on 12-4-2019. Response deadline was 1-6-2020. Requester was Bethany Simpson, Data Acquisition Specialist from Smart Procure. Uh, requested all purchasing records from 9-3-2019 um, uh, to current specific information requested from record keeping system is purchase order numbers, purchase order date, line item details, line item quantity, line item price, vendor ID number, name, address, contact person in their email address, Follow-up was done by Rose DeSico, and the request was uh, fulfilled, and the response was sent on 12-30, 2019. Amount of time spent on that request, approximately 30 minutes of um, office time. Seems like we've had that one before. Yeah. Um, we, well, some of these are repetitive, and uh, that, well uh, that well could be. Uh, before we no move to number eight, Pat, I've uh, just got a couple of others here. I uh, want to remind uh, the board and anybody that may be listening in to us uh, this evening that um, the District 128 Foundation for Learning, this is our first D128 Day for Giving. So 128 for 128. Uh, and uh, Mary, I don't know what her update is right now, but um, she's probably calculating as we speak. <laughs> but we've never done this before, so anything we raise in this, uh, obviously will go directly to um, fund our innovation grants and also our students in need and we'll add to what we've been able to do through um, the big event. So, drum roll please. We are currently at $4,319. That's great. So about a third, a third of our goal. It's really good for a first year out. And so I think Mary and I talked about there may be some follow up the next couple of days. Hey, if you missed the opportunity to, <clears throat> but you'll miss all the big giveaways because there have been giveaways all day. Uh, before I came over here tonight, Mary had me pull a name uh, between 6.15 and 6.30, whoever donated got a chance for some swag. And so I pulled the name before we came over here, and uh, lo and behold, the former board president at District 128 um, won uh, one of our prizes tonight. So, uh, very cool. So, um, so uh, last thing on this independence <coughs> agenda tonight, uh, this is uh, the time of the year we do one of our semi-annual review of closed minutes. After reviewing those minutes, the administration is recommending that we do not uh, release any of those uh, minutes as we are allowed to do under law uh, at this point. And if there are no questions or further discussion needed from the board, Pat, we will not need to go into closed session for that uh, purpose. And if that's the case, then I'll be looking for a recommendation to not release uh, any of the um, closed session minutes. Okay, is there a motion to not release the closed session minutes? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Anybody opposed? Okay, roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Tesso. Aye. Rooney. Aye. All right, motion carries. <clears throat> okay, and uh, just one other, other, uh, then we can move on and the rest of the agenda will probably move um, fairly quickly. Uh, the board will recall about a week ago uh, that it received uh, an email from a citizen who was encouraging the board um, to begin to uh, take a more active role in gun safety in the home. And um, as usual, I responded initially on behalf of the board. Bryant uh, would be someone that would um, really take that to the next level. Brian has emailed back and forth with that individual. 
several times. In the last uh, probably 12 hours, uh, the board and I and Bryant uh, have received multiple emails which are essentially the same email. They're cut and paste emails on the same uh, topic. So um, just to read one of those uh, into the record um, and then I'll tell you uh, what we recommend at this point. As a resident in District 128, I'd like to request that you please include education all parents about secure gun storage as part of your targeted school violence prevention policy. Data compiled by the U.S. Secret Service from all previous school shootings indicates the following. 75% of school shooters were students in the school. 78% of school shooters obtained the guns from their home or the home of their relatives or friends. According to the U.S. Secret Service, addressing student access to guns is a critical component of any school-based threat assessment intervention plan. Approximately 4.6 million children live in a household with at least one gun that is stored, loaded, and locked. Raising awareness in a proactive manner to all parents about the importance of keeping guns locked could help us work together to decrease the likelihood that children in the district have access to a loaded, unlocked gun. Thank you so much for your hard work and efforts for keeping our kids safe. So we received three or four of these uh, this afternoon. So on the grand scale, we all agree that everything is important about school safety. Um, the resource for parents to reach out to if they're interested in gun safety already exists through our local law enforcement agencies. who would be more than happy to help any parent uh, who wanted to get knowledge of securing guns. For those people that live outside of municipalities, for example, up in Oak Gro uh, Green Oaks where I live, uh, is really covered by the um, Lake County Sheriff, they would be happy to do that as well. So to duplicate that effort and the expenditure of tax dollars to do that service, um, you know, not, may not make the greatest uh, sense. Um, Brian will share a little bit more information here moving forward, but um, there are also uh, organizations out there that want to have access to our kids and our parents through normal, our normal events. So for example, um, any event that we have at school, they would like to have a table set up. Um, and there are organizations around this issue that fall into that. And we cannot give those outside organizations total access to our students and parents, okay, because in a public setting, if we allow that accessibility, and we have to allow that accessibility to everyone, even some groups that we would not be supportive of, uh, you know, having them uh, come into. So, Brian, I don't know if you want to add uh, anything else to that. Sure, and, and some of the concerns came up um, because uh, our citizens were looking at the board meeting and, and knew that we were looking at board policy 4190 and adopting that, which had to do with threat assessment teams. And so I have pointed out uh, to them that as part of our threat assessment team that is being developed at both buildings and our threat assessment procedures, <coughs> that if we feel that there is a threat um, or we have a student that there is a situation, part of the threat assessment team is involved in local law enforcement. So that's one of the members of the team, and we would work with local law enforcement who would then maybe do a home visit to ensure that there are you know, weapons, if there's weapons available at home, um, whether it's knives or guns, that they are properly secured, you know, discuss the parents and bring the parents into that conversation. Um, so that's when we look at what we feel is a threat. And what um, we're being asked is to really educate all of our parents um, on proper gun safety, and as Prentice pointed out, there are, I think, other organizations, law enforcement, that you know could, you know, help to educate parents. <coughs> we did have a, um, a healthy, um, a health and wellness fair at uh, Vernon Hills um, this past year, and we did have outside organizations that came in and talked about a lot of different things, whether they were local CrossFit gyms or other things in our lobby, and we did have an organization come in um, and have the table set up to share you know, with our students. What we're being asked is a little bit more to have access at open house or registration, eighth grade registration, but we're just not, I think, in a position to be able to do that because we have a lot of organizations that want to be able to come to those nights, whether they're helping with um, financial aid or college assistance outside organizations. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. And so 
I have responded to um, some of the emails leading up to the meeting, um, and then I'll respond to the emails that we received today. So, thanks. Thank you. So again, just to reinforce, safety and security of our students and staff number one priority. The board has invested <coughs> over four million dollars in additional security. Uh, we work closely with local law enforcement and our first responders, um, and we review that work. Uh, they do uh, crisis intervention drills, uh, not only for our local police departments, but the entire area um, over that. And uh, of course, we are very concerned about you know, weapon safety, uh, but the appropriate form for that, again, there are resources out there that already exist that the public is paying for through their tax dollars. And so um, at this point, you know, we believe that's a more appropriate resource. Yeah. Um, so just one question. I agree with that 100% because when I first saw that, those emails, I had the same response. And I don't know that it's our responsibility to educate the entire public on that particular topic. But if I was to just assume, let's just assume that one of the key drivers of violence in schools is kids do have access to guns at home and blah, 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 blah. It would seem like a good thing to try to reduce that, if we could. Um, so if that was a fact, uh, I guess I'd only challenge us to think about, is there anything else we can do? For example, can we drive people to those other resources and assist them in those efforts? So I'm not looking for an answer today, but I know my initial <coughs> response was, uh, it's not really our job. But the more I sit here and think, and think about it and listen, I wonder whether there's anything we could do because we have access to the community in a way that maybe not everybody does. Is there something we could do that would help us in our bigger picture goal? I don't know. And one of the things that we have offered to one of the groups is that they could have, um, so we do offer our auditoriums, gymnasiums to outside groups to be able to put on programs or a rental program that they could, you know, book a space and do an evening presentation and invite people um, you know, as an outside group, and they are more than welcome, you know, to do that. Um, so it's something to, to look at. If yeah, they and, wanted, I, and I don't know what the solution is, right? I can put on so you know, we sat here and said, boy, if only we could get it to the point where, you know, kids didn't have access to guns at home. No, I don't envision we're going to hold a seminar and say anybody in the neighborhood wants to come, will come to our place and we're going to tell them that. But how do we get them to go to the police departments or, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud at this point, but... <laughs> You know, if that's a root cause of some of these issues, it would seem like it would be one we would want to try that. Do our kids at any point uh, have any kind of instruction on what to do if they come across a gun? I would say that that topic, I believe, is covered. I would have to confirm, but when our school at Libertyville and the school resource officer visits with all of our freshman link crew, uh, I believe that topic is discussed in terms of um, how to report it, but I can confirm that. So I think it's addressed in the feeder districts for kids, little kids. <clears throat> so if you go to somebody's house and there's a gun laying out, you don't play with it. Um, so there, there's some sort of education that happens with our students in the school building that directly relates to their safety in the high school. It would be like Tom said when the resource officers yeah. work with the kids when they first come in. Yeah. I would. Be, I, I know the officer visits and goes through a number of things, and I think visits more than once a semester um, because it covers topics like vaping and stuff like that. But I can confirm. I need to confirm if they actually cover what to do if you see a gun. Tom, is this uh, something that a group like Parent Cats? could take up? I mean, I know Vernon Hills parent groups are organized a little bit differently, but what they're really asking is education resources for parents who might have guns in their home and you know, perhaps store them there, proper storage, what gun safes are appropriate for what guns, things like that. Um, I don't know if that's something some of the parent organizations maybe could help connect resources with at the very least. That's a possibility, right? Um, Again, maybe as a conduit to connect right, them. Yeah, right, that's really, so that's really that's what we can really offer. Key. There are people that this is their life, this is their job. Right. That is be not more, us. Be more than, they'd be more than happy to do that. So, I mean, we would certainly, be more, we, we always act uh, when we can to be a resource connector. And certainly the parent groups do that. <coughs> we, we do that as well. Um, I think um, 
you know, we have two great police departments here, and really Lake County Sheriff has been very responsive. So just like uh, as we talked to district office today, the fire departments, if somebody calls and said, hey, I, I don't know about if my smoke detector is working, they love to make those calls, right? Because if they make that call, so if you think about the police, if they can prevent a tragedy sure. in the home, not even in school, but a tragedy from happening with a gun in the home, they're, they're more than happy to do that. So yeah, we can probably do that connecting, but I think we just want to make sure that people realize those resources are already there. Right. And an outside group or outside groups that want to come in here and get access to our kids and our parents, okay, we don't do that for, you know, we don't do that for organizations because we have to allow all of those organizations to do that. So, okay, so, yeah. it, so we can look yeah. at ways we might I mean, be even just putting it in the parent newsletter sure. because really it's a parent directed information. It's yeah. not necessarily educating the students we're talking about here. It's, it's talking about giving parents the resources. If you want to learn more about this, yeah. here's where you can go. Yeah. And we don't have to bring anybody in to discuss it necessarily, but here are, here are the links, here are the organizations that are responsible for things like that. Okay. Uh, Bryant, is there anything else you want to add to that? Okay, Pat, good. believe it or not, that's that good. This, that All right, so the consent agenda is listed. We reviewed it earlier in the month. Can I send a motion to, uh, to approve the consent vote agenda as listed? I motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed. Second. Smoke <coughs> call, please. Carmichael. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Essel. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Batson. Aye. All right, motion carries. Rogan and personnel. Okay. Um, we've got a couple items here. We have some board policies for a second reading and couple. adoption. Mm -hmm. um, Read the names. Uh, I don't think you have to. You can just see yeah, yeah. I think as, So we'll, we'll approve these. We went through them uh, at committees meetings in the past couple months. Uh, we went through them quite thoroughly. We made some adjustments uh, as requested, and uh, they were uh, presented for a first reading last month. So we, we've gone through these quite a bit. So uh, that being said, uh, we have a motion and a second to adopt uh, for the second reading adoption of these board policies. I move to adopt the second reading uh, board programs and policies. Second. Any questions, comments for? Okay, roll call, please. Rudy. Aye. Hassel. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Okay, that uh, motion passes. Uh, I will read down these real quick. We have a, a section B here is board policies. These are for the first reading. Uh, since they haven't been uh, discussed yet in a formal board meeting. Uh, these have been discussed in committee, but uh, policy 2 colon 70, vacancies on board of education. Uh, policy 2 colon 100, board member conflict of interest. Uh, policy 2 colon 200, types of board of edu education meetings. Policy 2 colon 220, board of education meeting procedures. As you can tell, those are all related to our, our, the operation of our uh, Board of Education. Uh, policy 4 colon 15, identity protection. Uh, these are all under operational services. Policy 4 colon 30, revenue and investments. Policy 4 colon 60, purchases and contracts. Policy 4 colon 80, accounting and audits. Policy 4 colon 150, facility management and building programs. Uh, and then under personnel, it's policy 5 colon 100, staff development program, 5 colon 200, terms and conditions of employment di dismissal, 5 colon 220, substitute teachers, 5 colon 250, leaves of absence, uh, 5 colon 290, employment termination and suspensions, policy 5 uh, colon 330, sick days, vacation, holidays, and leaves. Uh, 6 colon 20 school year calendar and day, which is a timely topic. Uh, policy you know, 6 colon 300 graduation requirements and then under uh, the title of students, uh, policy 7 colon 180 prevention and abuse of response to bullying. These will all be discussed again at the policy uh, program. Of, um, <laughs> I can't see a pro pro program of personnel away. committee uh, meeting. Uh, this next month. So if anyone has any interest in getting into the details of that, feel free to join us. 
Uh, there's no action needed on those. Educational tour requests, this is a tour request that came in after the uh, uh, agenda was uh, put together and the consent agenda was put together. So we have this one uh, Operation Snowball at the uh, YMCA camp in McLean. Uh, so if we can have a motion for this. Move to approve the educational tour request. Second. Questions or comments? Um, what budget is this coming out of? Do we know? The expense, the district expense for the snowball trip? Uh, the district cost, of the um, snowball is funded in part through a grant. There is no district cost for the district. Okay, thank you. I couldn't locate the documents for oh, that one in my materials. There is no district cost. So there is, uh, it is student funded through the activity and there's also a, a, a grant that is uh, awarded to schools to support these kinds of programs. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other comments or questions? Yeah, district, uh, I, I located the district cost of trip is zero, the cost of student is zero. Um, okay, any further questions, comments? Roll call, please. Hessel? Aye. Rooney? Aye. Batson? Aye. Carmichael? Aye. Rooney? Aye. And then uh, last but not least, we had a couple of employment of employees uh, issues here at the, that uh, came in after the uh, consent agenda was uh, developed. So if we can have a motion for these. Motion to approve, approve the employment of employees. Second. Any, any questions or comments? Roll call, please. Rudy? Aye. Batson? Aye. Carmichael? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Hassel. Aye. And that concludes program and personnel. Okay, uh, facilities and finance, I'll take this um, since the <coughs> is out. School maintenance project grant approval. <coughs> yeah, um, in the previous committee meeting, we discussed the school maintenance project grant. So that is um, for anyone new to the board since 2014, uh, the state periodically uh, makes available funds to schools for uh, maintenance project grants. And so this uh, one is released very similar to the one last time and the one before that, um, where there's enough money for basically every school district in the state to get a $50,000 matching grant to use towards a school uh, maintenance project. And uh, so the districts have to apply, it has to be approved. The application has to be approved by the board. Um, and we apply for that, and so you have to do, in order to get the full 50,000, you have to do a project that's at least 100,000. So um, the state knows that the reality is not every district does that, because you have to have the $100,000 up front to do that, not every district uh, is in a position to do that. Um, the conditions for the project account, you know, for us, we have all kinds of projects going all the time in various phases, and so for it to count towards this project has to be one that, that it has to be a project that one, the board has not already committed money to, meaning you could not have already awarded bids to something, and two, um, it can't, the work cannot have already started. So that, that's really what we look at for the projects, and there's, there's priority ranks with the state. The first is if you have an emergency project and you have to state what the emergency is, we don't have any that qualify. Um, after that would be a health, uh, health life safety uh, project that you would do relative to the health life safety report we have to file with the state. Uh, we don't have anything that would hit that threshold. That we don't have any projects that big. Um, third would be any state uh, funded, I'm trying to think of how they word it, it's like a state funded program that the state really cares about. So for example, we get money for CTE um, from the state. If we were going to do a project in a CTE area of our district, um, that would be a third priority. The fourth priority is other maintenance projects around the district. So that's what the, this project that we've, we would like to use this to apply for is uh, one of the projects that we're planning for this upcoming summer is replacement of a few, uh, interesting, I just, I just realized something, uh, replacement of a couple of roofs at LHS as part of our cycle. Um, a few of them are little canopies, but the one is the roof above the autos department, which is CTE, so it's maybe interesting. I can change the priority level. Um, but uh, yeah, the roof needs to be replaced there. And so based on all the roofs there, we've, we've estimated right now, maybe it's about 400,000 or so. Uh, but we wrote that stuff into the grant. 
Uh, so that's really the, the project that we're looking to do to have the state send us some money. Um, you know, if 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 the if this grant didn't it didn't exist, we would still be looking at doing this project next year. Um, this will just help offset the cost by 50 grand. So um, this is uh, okay. yeah, the requires board approval. So I put all the application materials in there. You know, to see what our application is. It's pretty basic and straightforward. It's 12, about 12,800 square feet of roofing that we're looking to replace uh, altogether. And so. Yeah, one of the things that we are doing also with that, we'll get into, I think, at the next committee meeting more about that project. Uh, but one of the things we're doing also with that area is making it solar ready. You know, so it, it's making sure it's strong enough to hold um, that I don't think we need to do anything, any reinforcements to the roof. For that roof, you have to look at each roof and make sure, because some roofs you might need to. That one doesn't need it, and they're also going to make sure, like a conduit is put in initially so that everything kind of get down so you don't add it later. So that's kind of until we get a better footing on how we're going to be doing solar on a systematic basis, you know, the solar ready is kind of the, the, what we're shooting for for the roofs. So um, that's the project requires the board to approve the application. It's not you committing the money for that project. It's you approving the application. All right, so there's a motion. Is there a motion to approve the school maintenance project grant approval? I'm sorry, grant as written. Sorry. <laughs> So moved. Second. Discussion? All choked up. Got you all choked yeah. up. Any discussion? All right, roll call, please. Batson? Aye. Carmichael? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Hessel? Aye. Rooney? Aye. All right, motion carries. All right, uh, Coke contract. So this was something that was not in our committee, um, but it came uh, last week, and just kind of with the timing of everything, we wanted to include that. Uh, for approval. So really the, the meat of it is the, the Coca-Cola contract with Vernon Hills. Um, it, we got it back and finally settled on all the terms. Uh, but we, we've been negotiating that contract for about four months um, to kind of finalize everything. And so, because you send it and it takes a while and you get it back and it takes a while. So that's just why it's been taking uh, some time to do that. So we finally got the final one back and everything is all good. Uh, ready to go. So what this is is a contract that you, I think you have in front of you. Carol, is yeah. that right? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's good. There you go. So that's, those are the contracts uh, for uh, Vernon Hills. Um, the, so the way it works is those contracts will run through August of 23. Um, last year we had done the LHS contract, which also took a while to negotiate. Um, and that was a five-year ending in February of 23. Um, I would really like to not keep negotiating one contract per building each year when they end up being extremely similar language. You and we go through the, the same question process. right out of my mouth for a second time tonight. Why do we have building contracts instead of a district contract? Um, because at a at, at point in time in the past, uh, Liberty, or Vernon Hills was not with Coke, they were with a different provider. And so those, they just kind of operated on their, on their own. Um, and so what I was, we were presented last year was, LHS contract is up, so we need to do something about it. Okay, well, I'm gonna look at the contract and I'm gonna take a look. Well, what about Vernon Hills? Well, Vernon Hills is still under contract for another year. Well, all right, then I can't do anything with that until then, but I have to address the LHS contract. So the idea is, um, that's why there's an amendment to the LHS contract. So what the amendment for LHS is basically extending that contract through the same termination period as this one for Vernon Hills. So they will all be done August of 23, and then we will have a contract for the entire district uh, from that point on going forward. So the, the short version, Lisa, is Libertyville historically had been a, a Coca-Cola school. And when Vernon Hills came in and they bid a new contract, Pepsi gave them a really good deal to get their contract, so they were a Pepsi school for a long time. And then um, last time or the time before, maybe even when Ellen was here, or John, maybe after you came, uh, Coke came back in because they bid. When the contract's up, Coke and Pepsi are going to bid on those contracts. Then Coke came back with a better deal than Pepsi had, and Vernon Hills became a Coke school at that time because Libertyville was already under contract. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they were at different times. So now we're syncing those two contracts together, and when they're both done, so that's what the amendment is, that's what Dan is mm -hmm. 
did a such a did a great job and explaining that. Part of the reason why it took so long to do this because really our initial starting point was just take our LHS contract and slap Vernon Hill's name on it and we're done. We spent all this time doing it. In the period of time where we finished the LHS, uh, Hope's whole legal thing kind of redid their contract and so it was trying to make sure all the things are in the right spot. So like all the contract language is almost exactly the same, it's just all in different spots and so you have to make sure as much as people tell you, like, oh yeah, they're good to go, like, right, trust but verify. Um, the verification takes a while, especially when you have that many pages of language that you want to confirm. And just for the public, this, the contract with Coke results in us getting additional revenue to use for the kids in our two schools, okay? It's yeah. Uh, yeah. So in Coke yeah. for the privilege of having Coke. Yeah, right? this, this is a contract that generates more than $1,000 in revenue for the district. So the board by law has to approve these contracts. And so that's why this contract is here before you. The proceeds for this goes to the student activities um, in various ways. Um, it gets utilized in the schools for different staff activities, student activities, athletic activities, all kinds of stuff. There's scholarships that it's used for. There's um, meeting stuff. There's flowers. That, so it's, 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 a, it's a really, uh, really valued, I think we're valued source for the schools to do a lot of the fun, interesting, miscellaneous yeah. stuff that schools do. It's super important. Yeah. And also, just for the record, this is not just sugary Coca-Cola in the machines. It's a lot of Because we can't do it. No, yeah, Coca-Cola owns a lot of stuff. I mean, there is sugary Coca-Cola stuff, but there's also water, vitamin water, athletic Juice. drinks. Yeah, correction, there is no sugary Coca-Cola. Can't have power in, there's iced tea, there's young. There's a lot of diet that has smart water and sound. You got diet, you can't have any sugar by law anymore. So even though the contract says Coca-Cola, it's really a lot of other. Right. Well, it's Coke products. Yeah, it's Coke, it's Coke, Coke products. products. Uh, real quick then, section 3A, I just read through it as fast as I could here. Sponsorship fees and the Vernon Hills agreement are $32,000, $8,000 a year for the four years, right? Mm -hmm. But what is it? this first amendment is to the Libertyville agreement, if, and it says the aggregate is $7,000. Of, of the period of the extension. So that's our the extension, I got it. So February until yeah. August. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. All right, is there a motion to approve the... Um, and let's, we, yeah. we have to say one other thing, okay. just in case anybody, you know, ask you this question, and that is, the revenue stream is a bit larger at Libertyville than Vernon Hills because Libertyville has more students who are using the products. So that results in more profit at Libertyville than Vernon Hills. So if you get that question. Okay. And we have been getting a number of questions about these contracts as they're on our agenda. And so you may see an article in the paper about it. Yeah, Russell's been back and forth with Dan today. And there's, there's not just here, but everywhere. So, um, there may be something online tonight or tomorrow, so just so you're aware of that. I mean, at the end of the day, one, the one question I have, I haven't looked at it downstairs, but if I buy a bottle or whatever's in there in our vending machine, is it, is it competitively priced with if I go to some, you know, gas station or something like that? I mean, to me, the important thing if I'm in the community is to make sure the kids aren't getting ripped off because we're getting this payment from Coke, but I thought our prices were actually below market. Yes, you're cheaper than 7-Eleven or something like that. I just like that. don't know. I've never... I was pretty sure when I looked at it before. Yeah, they're, they're definitely at or below. Yeah, they're okay. Definitely not higher. Okay. So, in, in essence, this is a generous contribution on the part of Coke to... Yes. Our, to <laughs> they, 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 this is what they're bidding for. I mean, I'm sure there's good marketing in it for them. That, you know, when you go to college, you're drinking the same thing you go to drink in high school with. That's okay. Right? All right, is there a motion to approve the Vernon Hills... Actually, nope. let's do the Liberty Zone first. The Liberty Zone Student yeah. Activity Coke contract. I move to approve the amendment to the LHS Student Activities Coca Cola contract. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Carmichael? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Hessel? Aye. Rooney? Aye. Batson? Aye. Our motion carries. Uh, is there a motion to approve the Vernon Hills Student Activities Coca Cola contract? So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? Roll call, please. Rudy? Aye. Hessel? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Batson? Aye. Carmichael? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Both motions carry. Good on that? Anything else on FNF? I don't think so. Okay, I'm going to do something really quick on CO. Karen is not here. Um, so we had some pretty strong comments from one of our residents, all right? 
Uh, let me just update you. I thought I talked to you guys after I went to one of the board meetings. I think it was late November. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, you did. I did. Did yeah. you touch base with Kelly since then? Uh, I had the conversation immediately following the meeting. I nothing okay. since then. Okay. Long and short, it's there are issues in CETA. All those issues are well recognized. Okay. I will tell you, after I sat through a few minutes of the board meeting, I was actually quite surprised. But by the end of the meeting, I felt quite confident that the administration in CETA is taking appropriate action to deal with each and every one of the issues that they're dealing with. Okay. And it is a very, I'll call it tragic and serious situation. Um, so among other things, they have a task force. Um, they had a task force, but as a result of that meeting that night, they've kind of, uh, I think, knocked that up a notch. Um, that has been meeting regularly. Um, I have read through the December minutes and the January minutes. The one thing I'll share with you quickly, um, just so you know what's going on, is um, in December they had a task force. There was 28 participants, and they had their December meeting really to refresh their goal setting. Okay, um, and so there were. Each participant was asked to actually highlight three areas basically where they felt they were, they were weak or where there were concerns and three areas where they're actually doing things pretty well. Okay. And then the groups got together, came to consensus. And I'm just gonna share with you um, the three areas of ongoing concern. So we'll start there. Uh, and, and those are one, the need to create a shared vision of professional development to increase student engagement and positive interventions. A lot of what you've read about are these interventions with these students. Um, and, and how that's being handled. The second one was ongoing planning for consistency and teaming of dysregulated students into written procedures to support staff and students. To some extent, I think the staff is not clear at this point on what they can do, what they can't do, and, and a lot of the, I'm gonna call it norms around that, frankly, are changing, um, and so they're having to deal with that. And then the third thing, again, ongoing concern is developing a mindset for change uh, and self-care supports for the staff. It is clearly an environment where things are changing and the staff kind of needs to come with them on that and so they've been struggling on, on how to do that. All right? So that's, that's, those are the three things I've identified to, to, to work on, I'll call it first. That means the only three things you're going to work on, but it's clearly three that they're, they're concerned about. Uh, then there were things highlighted as positives. All right? uh, one, a uh, safer environment due to staff to student ratios, which was certainly a topic of uh, conversation last year. Two, the staff bonding as a more cohesive team. Um, that suggests to me they're making some progress there. Uh, and three, staff and students supporting each other when in crisis. All right, so those are the three things that they're, they're highlighting together that they think they're doing a pretty good job of. They need to keep going. So um, what I would like to suggest is, again, maybe in the, one of the October committee meetings, um, we get a further update from Karen, who goes to these meetings regularly. But also, I guess I was wondering whether it might make sense, and I, I hate to do this with Kelly, because I know she travels a, a big distance after work, but in a committee meeting we start early, would it be reasonable to think maybe she could come in and give the board a slightly deeper dive into see it all and what's going on there and look at the comments that we had? Because I don't want anybody to be in the dark, and, and I do feel sometimes what we read in the press gives you one side of the story. It's an important side, but I think it's important that we understand the other side, because I can assure you each and all those issues are being addressed and being addressed very thoroughly so thank and I think you did a good job either last month or the month before really pointing out where the meeting began and where it ended and once you had more context I clearly understood there were some things that had to be done yep. immediately legally there uh, that the administration was working on and there was you know another side of the equation so yeah we'll, we'll talk to Kelly yeah, once we talk to Kelly and see I think it would be really helpful um, because I mean I think at this point look this is very legitimate and Again, another passionate uh, piece of feedback that I think we are aware of and we need to be comfortable that because we're sending students to see it all, it's, or it is probably comfortable still doing that. So I think it would be worth more than a brief update at a board meeting and spend some time. Um, Kelly is very well connected to what's going on there. Um, I had a conversation with her after that board meeting and just was very impressed with her understanding of what's going on in seat all, her understanding of the issues at seat all her understanding of what's being done to correct them, and she's just got a great perspective. So, I right at the beginning of uh, I think we'll do it right at the beginning. We'll do P and P. We'll yeah. do it right at the beginning. Let her do her thing, and then she can she can head home. But I, I think it would be good. I, I would hate for the feedback we got to not re result in some kind of response, so that we're all adequately informed and um, you know aware of what's going on because it is a pretty significant thing that's going on there. 
And part of and part of the big <coughs> issue that you're reading about is the whole issue of restraints. So that yeah. hasn't been sorted out yet because there's two sides of that too. There's also a danger side to staff and other students for some students. Um, and so the state's still working through that as well. And uh, it's just an important topic to say. It's an important with. topic and right. a very, very challenging one. And, and I think um, Kelly was also going to touch base with you and Karen regarding the CLR with the joint agreement. So um, so I, I think we, we can do both of those maybe at the right. same time. Yeah. Uh, P and P committee meeting. So she wanted to touch base, I think, with Karen ahead of time on that. But then she did want to talk to the whole board um, about that piece. So we were kind of already earmarking that next P and P to have her come in. So. Right. And who's going to follow up with the parent that addressed <coughs> the board? Okay. We've already talked to them uh, tonight. Um, so I touched base with her tonight and Kelly. They, they've been in contact also with Kathy Marcel, who's our works with our therapy day students. Um, so Kathy's already been in touch with them, and Kelly's kind of been involved a little bit, but um, Kelly and I will contact the parent again, so i talked talk to her tonight, so. Okay. All right, again, I'm confident when, when, when you get more information and better understanding of what's going on there, you'll be satisfied that the, the professional team at CEDAW is doing all their things. I know when I was briefed on it, you know, I, I, was, I was convinced that it would be just like it was done here. I mean, right. we, when we have a personnel matter or we have other, you know, serious matters of this type in our buildings, I think one of our strengths has always been we don't sit around and think about it and talk about it. We actually take action. You know, we, we get the facts that we need uh, and we take very appropriate action. Okay, that action is not always um, popular. Um, but I think we've always felt it was appropriate. And I felt the same way coming out of that conversation in CEDAW. And admittedly, I did not when the conversation started. It wasn't until I was fully informed that I said, oh, okay, I think I understand, A, why this is so difficult, and B, why it's, it's appropriate. All right? And I think okay. Kelly, Kelly has said repeatedly that Val Don, who's the executive director, uh, for the past few years is uniquely qualified to take CEDAW where it needs to go programmatically, legally, all of that, and I would agree with that assessment. So, which again, you may not hear universally in the public and or among from people some, at CEDAW. or from, from some, some staff. Okay, right? Yeah. So that's why I think it's important to be educated on this topic. It's a okay. complex. Issue. It's a very complex and we issue. Do need to get to you know it's a, what the facts are yeah. so that we can. Yeah, this, one, this one's pretty though. serious, and I think it's important because there will be more articles written on this, um, as I understand it. Okay? All right. So, given that the last board meeting was, I believe, an hour, and I wasn't there, and this one is now running to two and a half, and I feel a lot of job security here. So we, can all tell, <laughs> so we can all tell Kevin, it's not for the staff The right? enthusiasm on Dr. Gilliam's face is overwhelming me there. Um, okay, He's however, we are okay, not finished yet. Third, um, yeah, so can I ask for a motion to convene an executive session, closed session? I move to convene an executive well, session for the collective negotiating matters. Five miles CS 120 slash 2C2. All right, this shall be brief, Second. I hope. Yep, it will be right. brief. Uh, oh, sorry, call. Oh. Kessel. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Uh, again, no action being taken after this meeting, so thanks, everybody. Aye.